Welcome to the Eat Sleep Race podcast. I'm your host, Frankie Five, co host, Brian ESR. And today we have Honda Pro Jason. Thanks for coming by. How's everything? Everything's awesome, brother. Thank you so much for having me. So let's jump into it. Yeah. Let's do it. I think uh, I remember meeting you back in Import Alliance. You know, what is, who is Honda Pro Jason? That's a great question. So I'm a Honda enthusiast, number one. I've been a Honda enthusiast since 1987. I, um, my parents bought their first car in 87. I just kind of fell in love with the brand. I started selling cars in 96, started YouTube in 2012, and now I travel the world spreading Honda love, basically. So 87, par- parents bought their first Honda. Yeah. You fell in love with it. Were you, and, and you became like a, a, not became, you did become a diehard on the enthusiast. Were there other things that you were interested in along the way, like any sports or stuff like that? Or were you always a car guy? No, I was a car guy and bodybuilding. I was in a bodybuilding when I was started like 14 years old or so. Wow. Uh, yeah. And then you started selling Hondas like at a dealership? Yeah, I started selling Hondas uh, back in 96. So basically I was the guy that told everyone else about how great the product was and I kept going back to the dealership after I bought my car my first new car in 94 I bought a 94 Honda Accord LX or uh, EXL kept going back to the dealership telling everyone how much I love the car and they're like hey listen your love of the car and the brand so much why don't we sell them I told them I'm like I didn't go to school to sell cars they're like oh don't worry we got you I'm like okay so I tried it for a couple months ended up staying there 20 years wow it was incredible. When was your last year selling cars? Uh, last year selling cars was 2016. Oh, wow. That's yeah. pretty recent. Yeah, pretty recent. So did was it Honda that offered you, or was it the dealership that offered you that? The dealership. Okay. Yeah, the dealership okay. offered me the job there. It just made sense to me because, you know, I could just tell my friends and family about how much I love the cars, but then Honda allowed me to tell other people Many, many other people, how much I love the cars. So how did you get engaged with Honda? So Honda, Honda Corporate. Corporate. Be, yeah. Yeah. So just to be clear, I don't work for Honda Corporate. Okay. I'm my own LLC, but I work with Honda Corporate. So they first found me once they started my YouTube channel. So I started that channel in 2012. They reached out to me maybe halfway through 2013. And it was funny because I was doing this show. It was all, all Honda news. And I was talking about Honda, using Honda's name all the time. And in the back of my head, I always thought, you know what? What if Honda called me one day and I like broke some law of theirs? You know, some, I don't know, whatever it was, you know? So one day I'm sitting at the desk and it, at this time, most of the phone calls that came into the dealership came in our cell phones. So all of a sudden I get a phone call and it's like, hey, you have a phone call on line five. That's weird. So I pick up line five and the guy goes, hey, this is so-and-so from Honda Corporate out in uh, California in Torrance. And my heart just dropped. I'm like, oh, crap, I'm in trouble. They're just going to totally yell at me and shut me down, and that's going to be the end of my whole YouTube thing. At that time, was your YouTube already Honda Pro, Jason? Yeah, it was. Okay. Yeah, all myself was Honda Pro. I was just starting. It was like a year and a half in. Right. But, you know, when you're just starting YouTube, you think you're bigger than you are. You know, it's just one of those things like, oh, I got a couple of gen- I got a couple of videos out. I got, you know, four or 5,000 followers or subscribers. So Honda reaches out and they're like, hey, you know, we're from corporate. We just want to talk to you. I'm like, okay, what about? Like, we just want to tell you how much we love you and support you. We wanted to show you, you know, that we love what you're doing with the brand. And we found out you were a salesman. We couldn't believe you were a salesman. We thought, you know, you were like a journalist or whatever. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Like, we want to send you a big swag bag. I'm like, okay, they sent me this huge box. Uh, A Dickies jacket, which I still wear, by the way. A bunch of stickers, hats, a whole bunch of swag. They basically wanted me to give that away on my channel. I'm like, cool. So that was my first introduction to Honda. Definitely not my last, but my first. So you went from selling Hondas. Does the Honda Pro now get a Honda for free? Funny question. So I could. So when the last generation Civic Type R came out, the FK8, I called Honda and I'm like, hey, listen, I have a great idea. How about if you guys give me a car? You know, for like a two-year lease or something, I could drive the car, promote the brand. I'll give it back to you when I'm done. They're like, yeah, we'll talk about it. They talked about it. They called me back and they're like, hey, listen, we're going to give you a car. 
Like we're going to give you a brand new FK8 for two years. That's awesome. They're like, well, there's one small catch. You can't modify it. And I'm like, eh, it's not going to work for me. They're like, why not? I want well, to paint it. Like, you're going to paint it. Why? I'm like, I'm going to paint it because I want to make it different. They're like, what color? I was going to be Phoenix yellow. And they're like, stop. Big mistake. And I have the email still. They go, no one wants to see a yellow Civic Type R. We did our surveys. No one wants a yellow one. I'm like, well, the good news for me is I'm going to buy it. I'll do anything I want with it. They're like, oh, we wish you wouldn't because it's going to look bad in the brand. I'm like, my car, my decision. And you guys all know what happened about four years later. They came out with their own yellow Civic Type R. And what did they, who did they survey? I mean, you come and ask me if I wanted a Phoenix yellow Type R, I would say yes. So I think what happens is they surveyed past Civic owners. And their survey basically went like this. We're going to come out with a new Civic, a special Civic. What do you guys think of the color? White, blue, black, red, yellow. yellow. Why would you want a yellow car? And they all stopped. They didn't survey previous Integra Type R owners. They didn't survey SI owners. They surveyed Civic owners. So you got the guy or the girl that's 60 years old driving a Civic. They want a yellow car. Why would they want a yellow car? So they said no to the yellow. Of course, I, as you guys probably know, I painted mine custom yellow. Completely frame off for us, basically restoration to a brand new car. Took the car, bronze wheels, yellow car, black roof, you know, carbon fiber roof. And then about two and a half years later, I'm out in Boston. I'm at a dealership. So I do a lot of dealership training. So I'm at a dealership. These Japanese executives are from Honda at the dealership talking to them about the new HRV that happened to just come out now. It's about, I don't know, four or five years ago. They're in there, we're talking, they know who I am. So we're taking pictures and everything. I go, hey, listen, I go, you know, you guys want to come check out my car? And one guy goes, what is it? I go, it's a Civic Type R. Like, ah, I was on, you know, part of the product planning team for that car. We know what it looks like. I've seen it a million times. I'm like, well, mine's Sunrise Yellow, which is the name of Phoenix Yellow in Japan. And they go, Sunrise Yellow. I go, yeah. He goes, I want to see it. He comes out, looks at it. He goes, can I take a picture? I go, yeah. I was all proud of it, right? He's taking all these pictures. He goes, I'm going to send these back home. I go, that's awesome. You know, hopefully they love it. And again, you know, three years later, they come out with the LE, which happened to be Phoenix Yellow, really Sunrise Yellow, with the black roof, bronze wheel. You know, like basically my car turned into. Did anyone ever give you the pat on the back, the official pat on the back on that? I don't need an official pat on the back, but I think it's amazing that, you know, there's a good possibility I had something to do with inspiring them to come out with the car. So I, I'm okay with that. It's weird though. So they surveyed Civic owners. Mm -hmm. You know that you're going to sell a Civic Type R to a specific genre of people that want to modify it and race the car. So I'm just like, how, what was the thought process? Is just, oh, let's go ask some Civic owners. How, how'd you even know they surveyed Civic owners? I, I, I talked to Honda Corporate. So they, Honda surveys people all the time. Uh, people are always asking, like the brand new Honda Accord came out right now without XM radio. It's the first Honda that came out without XM radio. It's not available on any trim level. And the reason why is they surveyed past owners and they said, hey, listen, you know, did you subscribed to XM after the three month period. And they said, no. So they got rid of it. Same reason they don't have home link, fog lights, all these things on the car they, they got rid of. They surveyed people. The problem is they surveyed people and they go, hey, are you using your fog lights? And they're like, I don't think so. Because they're on all the time. Yeah, they, they don't know any better. They don't know any better. And so how did Outlook say, go, well, if you're not using them, why would we put them on the car? Right. Let's take our money and put it somewhere else. So no fog lights, no XM radio, no home link anymore. They're getting rid of everything people aren't using, hopefully to make the product better for those people. Well, you That's know, the idea. You know, so going around like how they think about this. So it's funny because I know that you were kind of like in the middle of when the Integra, the new Integra came out. There was so many people that were very, very upset in how they designed the car. And Who'd you, they survey for that? Who, and, and this just goes with that. Like, you know, you said that they didn't think of the yellow and now and the design of the new Integra. It's like, do you know why it went that route? Which route exactly? Doesn't look anything, has no reference to the previous Integra. So let me talk to you guys about that since we're on this subject. 
and I've been talking to everyone about this already. The original Integra turned to the RSX, turned to the ILX, turned to the Integra again, right? Right. That's the basic revolution there. If it never got rid of the Integra name, you know what it would look like? It would look exactly what it looks like right now. It'd look like the Integra. And no one would say anything about it. But because they got rid of the name, and all we remember is the old Integra, we want it to look like it did in the 90s. And it doesn't. Yeah. And that's why we're upset. Yeah. So the new Integra is an amazing car. Oh, the Type, I actually do like the Type S. Type S is great. Yeah. The Type S is a slightly luxurious Type R. So I still have some issues with it. But that's that those are. But, you know, I, I get it. I get it. But, you know, and you grew up in the 90s and, you know, like you knew uh, for my from my perspective, the 90s were the best was the best era for hobbies. And so to to appreciate that so much back in the day and then come out and say this is the Integra, you kind of have to say, well, there isn't any nostalgia in it. You know, it's all marketing. I mean, just to be blatantly obvious. I don't think they planned on that being an Integra to the last right. minute. Otherwise, they would have put more Integra in it, not just the bumpers. Literally, that's all they did. So I think it was supposed to be an ILX, but then the old Integras started going and bring a trailer for stupid money. And people are like, oh my God, that's amazing. Anchor is like, well, why don't we jump on this bandwagon? Like, what are we sitting here doing? Why don't we bring back the Integra? Oh, uh, what are we going to do? I don't know. Put Integra on the bumpers. That's what they did. I mean, it's not not probably not a secret. They didn't plan to make this Integra for five years. So Honda plans for five years to make the car. So when the brand new Accord comes out or the brand new Type R comes out, they're already building the next Type R. It takes them five years to research and develop a car. So there's no way five years back they were planning on the Integra because they magically talked about it like not even a month before it came out. Yeah. So... You know, the first thing that I've seen, you know, in, in following your social media was the release of the new Integra, all the negative comments. Yeah. Like, how do you, how do you handle that? And, you know, just not the Integra. I'm sure there's other things too, where people just have, oh, you know what? I, I don't think I, you know, just have different sort of opinions. How do you handle the trolls? Yeah. I, I ignore them. Completely ignore them. I could care less. Isn't it good for the algorithm for you to oh, 100%. Have, have discussions with them though? Not really discussions, because I just don't want to feed into them. I, I have no problem with the algorithm. They'll have discussions amongst each other on my page. I don't need to enter it. So if there's someone that comes up and goes, hey, Honda Pro, you're a piece of crap. I can't believe you filmed that. Didn't say anything bad about it. Other people will go on and go, hey, don't talk to him like that. He's just covering the brand. And someone also jump in and be like, yeah, but he should have said something negative. Why should he say something negative? Because the car is a piece of crap. Well, it's not his place to say it. He's just a journalist. Oh, what about this? I let them take care of it, which is great for the algorithm. I just sit back and either watch or just ignore them. I got so much other stuff to do. I don't have time to deal with all the negativity online. I just ignore it. I like it. Yeah. That's a good. It works. And you know what? It, it It's also, that's part of the community that Jason has, because it's one thing for a lot of people to be negative, but like you just said, you have people standing up for you saying, hey, he's just a journalist. Hey, he's just a brand advocate. So that means you have a strong community behind you reading your comments right, right, right. and kind of doing your dirty work for you. Yeah. And it also is less stress for you, right? I mean, if you imagine you carrying this on your shoulders, I'm sure it would have an impact in how you become, you know, how do you continue to become an advocate for, for the brand? Totally. So got a question here. For aspiring brand advocates, what you clearly have a great community. You have a large social media following. What tips can you give to build a community for a uh, aspiring brand advocate? That's a great question. Uh, follow your passion. That's it. I mean, like, if you follow your passion and you do it for the right reasons, I didn't start YouTube to start making money. I did to spread the love of the brand, spread my message. I just wanted to enlighten and just educate and entertain other people. I think people that start it to make money are almost always going to fail. So I think I know this answer for you. Yeah. Because it's one thing to post content and do what you love, you know, talk about what you love, but it's another thing to build a community behind it. 
So it's one thing that you're putting the content out there, but how are you, I have your answer <laughs> if, uh, if you don't get to it, but I'm curious if we could hear it in your own words, how do you maintain and grow your community who enjoy watching what you post? Actually, before you answer that, yeah. you mentioned you had 5,000 subscribers on YouTube. How did you get to where you are now? And then with that question of how do you continue it? It's a it, it, very similar answer, really. Give more than you want to get back. So I was always a part of the community, but I was a small part. Once I started YouTube, I started really hitting a lot of the car shows, a lot of the car events. I started going on all the, if there was a blog about an issue with an Accord, they're like, oh yeah, we have this issue with Bluetooth. I jump in there, I'd be like, hey, this is how to solve it. This is how you fix it. So for days and days, actually months and months, I just go on there and go, problems with Bluetooth, uh, 2012 Accord, problems with door lock settings, 2022 Accord. I go into all the forums and everyone that had a problem, I'd solve it for them. I'd be like, oh, this is how that works. This is what you're doing wrong. This is how the system's supposed to go. And they're like, oh my God, thank you so much. Not wanting anything in return. Then I started making a name for myself, you know, as a Honda pro, you know, knowing everything about the cars. And it just kept- forums. Like, what, what forums were these? Because forums don't exist anymore. I, I shouldn't say forums, more like Facebook groups. Okay. I mean, like- But you were on Honda Tech. You oh yeah, were on Honda Tech and Template VTech and stuff like that, of course. I like that. I know something else that you do. You currently do it. You text message everyone on their birthdays. I don't know how you do it. I, I, I so I, I do. Uh, birthdays are huge for me. So here's what happened. I've always, a lot of people. I, I've, I've always been big on birthdays. Okay, so when I was 24, I let one of my ex girlfriends, girlfriend at the time, throw me a birthday party, and it sucked. There was like 20 people that showed up. I was like, this is not a party. So. As from that date, I threw my own parties. Up until I was, not to date myself, but up until I was about 48 years old, I did all my own birthday parties. And I parties- You just dropped a lot of people's jaws right there. You're yeah, like, sure. what? 48? Meaning you're how old now? Because you don't look a- I am a- You don't look a grip, little ounce over, you know, you look like you're in your 30s if I were to- 52. So anyway, we'll talk about- No that. way. Yeah, we'll talk wow. about that later. 1970. Everyone wants to know what is the secret to your fountain of youth here? The working out. It's probably the bodybuilding. The, the bodybuilding does help. And cheeseburgers? That hamburgers do help. So, also no soda. We'll, we'll get no into that. No let's let's we'll save that. Okay, okay. Yeah, we're, we're still so, about the birthdays. So, here's what happened with the birthdays. Ex girlfriend shows up my birthday. I started throwing my own parties. I had birthday parties with 100, 200 people because birthdays are huge for me. Facebook comes along and you get everyone's birthday, you get a notification. I'm like, oh, this is super cool. So all my friends on my actual, like my friends page, like the one you guys have, like friends and family, I always wish them a happy birthday. I started doing videos for them. They thought that was amazing. I started a Honda Pro Jason. I started two pages. I had like a, a fan page, the, the regular one, the business page, and then a friend page that I could friend people. Well, I maxed out at 5,000 friends. Cool. So every time it was somebody's birthday, I made a birthday video for them individually. So take 5,000 times 365, it was like 15 to 18 birthdays a day, 15 to 18 videos every single day. No way. Facebook sends me a message after like my second year, third year doing this. They're like, hey, uh, we're shutting you off. For spamming. For spamming. I'm like, how is that spam? The very next day after they shut me off, they came out with a, a whole new little thing. They said, hey, we're going to give you guys a frame. It's a birthday frame where you can make birthday videos and here's how to do it. Okay, that was weird. Yeah. Kind of ironic. Yeah. So then they turned me back on because they want to try the birthday thing. Because what happened is if you're doing 15 videos a day, you're going to catch their attention. Something You're taking up a lot of bandwidth. Yeah. Something's going on. So then they, they shut me down again and they said, hey, listen, your name's not Honda Pro Jason. Show us an ID. I didn't have an ID that said Honda Pro Jason, which led me to want to change my name officially, which I haven't yet, but I want to. So I, changed, I put my real name in there because you could put like in parentheses your real name, even though your biz, your uh, your nickname is something else. Right. So I did that. I was still doing birthdays for everybody. And then about three years ago, they totally shut me off. They're like, hey, you're using this as business. We're going to shut you off. You can't turn it back on. You can save all your info, but you're done. Wow. 
which sucks. They shut down your business account. No, they shut down my personal account. I had a personal account with 5,000 friends. That was doing a lot of advertising on and just just a lot of making, fr- you know, just connections. And you lost it. I lost it all. Wow. So I still, to this day, have people meeting me at shows, looking at me going, hey, listen, I don't know what I did, but you used to send me a birthday message. Do you not <laughs> like me now? I'm like, oh, dude, it's not me. It's Facebook. Now, 5,000 people think I don't like them. Wow. I'm like, oh, that stinks. But so how long did it go on for? Three years? Uh, it went on for about three or four years. So now I still have some, like, I got Brian's birthday, so I sent him a birthday message. And it's usually a video. And it was real simple. It's me, a uh, front-facing camera. Happy birthday, Brian, from Honda Pro, Jason. That's it. That's the video every year. And he used to do 15 of those a day. In a day. Happy birthday, Joey. Happy birthday, Caitlin. Happy birthday, Myra. Everywhere. I travel all over the world. Anywhere I was. Wouldn't matter what it was. I Wherever I was. And I'd make videos. It was how, fun. How do you build a community? That's, that's a good way to do it. So if you were different time zone did you send it at your date or did you send it on there so it's whenever there. facebook would notify you what i would do is i put it on their page it wasn't a message ah okay and i dumped it on their page on purpose because i dumped it on their page and all their friends and family were like typing happy birthday son yeah. happy birthday husband and here comes some random with a video How, who's this honda bro guy so now they look me up and now they follow me. So it was all kind of done for a reason. And that's, it, it helped build a brand for sure. That's not, that's why I said, I, yeah. I know the answer yeah, to this. You're right. You're, right, you're right. But that's only a piece of the formula. Of course. If you, if you got any other tips in there, you want to throw in <laughs> go for it. But that is, a, that's a huge one right there to organically communicate with your following, no matter how big or small they are. If you had it went, if you had a couple hundred, you would have done it. You had 5,000, you did it. I had a couple hundred and I did it and exactly. It, and it grew and it grew and it grew. It grew, exactly. And good for you, man. Now Thank you. Talk about putting in the work. So quality or quantity for content? It's a great question. Um, I think for social medias like YouTube, quality, Facebook, Instagram, quantity. Really, because you, you need to get more stuff out there on the other platforms. Like right now, as far as stories are concerned and reels, quantity, 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 quantity. Quality would be more for long form. Keep in mind that most people watch YouTube on their big screen TV. They don't watch Facebook on there. They don't watch Instagram reels on their big TV. They watch on their phone. So they just want to get through it real quick. Phone's this big. You know, quality, you want to sit back. They actually grab popcorn and they make a night of it and they watch videos on YouTube. So I think it depends on the social media platform for sure. And when you create your content, like your long form content yeah. for YouTube, do you specifically keep it on YouTube? Uh, normally, yeah. Normally I keep it on YouTube. I might cut it up and put it on Facebook or Instagram, but I'll keep it on YouTube. I won't post the same video on other social medias. So I know different brands, different pages tend to, when your community is on Facebook, they don't enter, they don't mix. Your YouTube community is one, your Instagram community is another. What is it for Honda Pro Jason? Is it one large pool? Is it, do you, tr- is it, do you see it as, uh, you know, your followers loyal to certain platforms? Totally. And they're all different. So they're different content for YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. I have a Yelp page. I do different content from my Yelp page. No so, uh, Oh yeah, I, I, Built a huge Yelp page. Oh yeah, I know it's I your face right now. So what happens is, I go to a place. I started this when I was selling cars, and the idea was I pull a brand new car in front of Subway. I take a picture of the car in front of Subway. I'd be like Subway, I love the sub. Thank you guys so much, Honda Pro Jason. And I put it in their Yelp page, and then what would happen is their uh, web page, excuse me, would pull from Yelp. So now I'm on their webpage. Honda Pro Jason's on Subway's webpage. I have people calling me all over the country going, hey, I was looking for a place to eat. I'm in North Carolina and your picture showed up. It's the weirdest thing ever. I got pictures all over the country on everyone's webpage because of the Yelp reviews and stuff I've done. You just came up with that on your own. I, I totally made that up. Wow. 
totally mad, but it works. Wow. And people are looking for social media. You need to get your name out there everywhere. Yelp, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, anywhere you can get your name and picture out there, you got to do it. Today, do you focus on one platform more than any other? Uh, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, I haven't been um, putting as much effort into YouTube just because they're not, honestly, just not paying as well as they used to. Facebook and Instagram are paying more, especially with Reels. So I've been putting more effort into them. It's not as fulfilling making a Reel versus making a long form YouTube video. I'd rather YouTube video, but the money's in Reels. So I, I kind of gone that way, you know? So uh, what is like your frequency now on on long uh, on YouTube? I'm going to take a sip of water here. Take a sip of water too. I'm a little parched. Yeah. So I should be making a couple of videos a week. I might make a couple of videos a month, which is just, I can give you a million excuses, but I've just, I've just been lazy. Honestly, that's about it. I've been traveling a ton. I've been concentrating on Facebook and Instagram because that's where I get a lot more reaction. You know, when you're on social media, you post something, you want people to like it, comment on it, you know, interact with it. And I get a lot more interaction and a lot more comments and stuff on Instagram and Facebook than I do on YouTube. You mentioned traveling a lot. Yeah. Decades of being a hot the brand advocate. Yes. Within these decades, what is your most memorable moment? In uh, Malaysia, the country of Malaysia. So you got, you, you, you want me to go, break that down yeah, a little bit? Break it down. So we're staring at you like, what? <laughs> when I, most memorable I, moment, I, Malaysia. I said like Japan, so not Honda corporate. What is your most memorable I, moment? A so country. I love, I love Japan, but. What happened in Malaysia that yeah. your most memorable okay. moment is there? So I went to, I was invited in Malaysia to go to a, a Honda event out there. What year? In uh, 20. 15. Okay. So I went out there and, excuse me, I was expecting third world country, possibly, you know, 50 or 60 Hondas. I was not expecting what I walked into. It was completely unbelievable. It was a college campus with five or six different parking lots with buses that drove people to the parking lots to see the cars. Each parking lot had a different model. The Honda Civic, Type R, the Honda City, the Honda Brio, um, Integras filled a whole parking lot. And then a bus drove you from parking lot to parking lot to see the different cars. How many cars do you think estimate? Uh, 1,500, maybe 2,000. Bro, I was blown away. I could not believe. All modified. All modified. I mean, it modified with like, Mugen Spoon, Endless, uh, Feels, like every all the top brands you could imagine, they were there. And I was like, what is going on? Like, it made no sense to me. So that just really set me back as it, maybe not my favorite place to ever go in my life, but the most memorable as far as like, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing with my own eyes. That crazy enthusiast in, in one. In Malaysia. All right. Like I go to H Day you know, twice a year. And I understand it. It's insane. It's crazy. But I know what's going to happen. Malaysia? I did not expect that at all. It was very surprising. So very memorable. Where is the largest, I guess, the, and the event or anywhere that you've seen the most Hondas gathered? Is it Malaysia 15... No, I'm, I'm going to have to say H-Day. Yeah, I think H-Day has the most Hondas and Acuras gathered anywhere. And you've been all around the world seeing Hondas. H-Day is the largest. H-Day is the largest event with the most Hondas. Second would be Honda Euro Meet in France. It's a close second. Honda Euro Meet is just more spread out. It's a three-day event. Everyone sleeps there, and they show the cars throughout the day, but it's it's more of a meet than a show. Not really any awards. Like they have a show and shine, which is like their VIP area. And their show and shine might have 18 or 19 cars. But then there's another seven or 800 cars around the whole event. 
where people, you know, tent next to them and sleep. And it's it's a massive event. Everyone from Europe goes there. We've so, been going to H Day since, honestly, the first. It, it used to be called Honda Day. Right, right, of course. So, yeah, yeah. They, uh, literally the first Honda Day we've crazy. been going to it. And actually, ironically, yeah. Francis is wearing a collab T-shirt that we did with H Day, Eat Sleep Race H Day T-shirt that we That's just. cool. We sold out of those, so you can't get those anymore. Sorry, guys. But no, that's it. For for yeah. me and Francis, being that we've gone to all 21 yeah. H, H Days Honda Years. Days. Yeah. That's why I ask, because I that's all I know. I haven't yeah. been to another Honda-only event you, outside. You got, you got to get out. You got to get out more. So Malaysia, you're saying, is, is a cool place. A Malaysia. You see a lot of Hondas. Yeah, I'm Malaysia. surprised you, I would have suspected Japan. You it, know what? The, the hotness is spread out there. Hotness, it is too spread out. It's yeah. bigger than people think. People think Japan, like I thought, Japan was just like this one country with Tokyo and all the cars were there. But then you get to Tokyo and you're like, there's, where are all there's, the cars? There's nothing here. <laughs> Where's all these modified cars then? It's a city. Right. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. You got to go to Osaka. Yeah. Okay, let's drive there. You ain't driving to Osaka. I've never even oh been there God. myself. I've been to Tokyo, not Osaka. What is that? You got to go to Osaka. Is that like a flight or a train it's a flight uh you could take a train too oh, wow. a train or a flight either way but that's where the majority of honda performance shops are no uh, they have some there they're actually all over the place it's too spread out it, it's totally too spread out that that's that's the problem so i guess the cool part with malaysia is they're all collectively yeah in the same area yeah mm-hmm. collectively the same i never area. i've never been to malaysia so you gotta go you should go to indonesia never been there that's either going saturday you should come with me no way you yeah, saturday. Going saturday. for a honda event yeah yeah, so Honda of Indonesia reached out to me, Sick. and they wanted me to come out and do an event with them. Sick. So it's it's gonna be insane. What's your favorite country for Honda events? That's tough. Still Malaysia? No, I mean for Honda events, I'm gonna have to say America, just because I've been to more here, and it's crazy because you can go to California to a Honda event and see cars, and go to the East Coast to a Honda event and see completely different, different cars, cars, completely different people. Yeah. You can go down to Florida, completely different cars, completely different people, which for me- that's Very diverse here in America. 100%. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Styles are very diverse. Yeah. Here. So when you say JDM, you know, that's a particular style in Japan. When you say USDM, it's kind of like very diverse here for USDM Hondas because like there's all different types of styles yeah. for oh, yeah. US Honda fans. And you see it at each day. Totally. A yeah. little bit of everything. What countries or continents have you not been to? I've never been to Australia, but I'm going there in about four days for a layover. So I can't say that for long. <laughs> but not no say, Honda events in Australia. For, for Honda events. Oh, for Honda events. Yeah, yeah. I've never been to Australia, never been to South America, never been to India. South, South America? You didn't go to an event in South America? South America. No, I've been to Guatemala. Oh, Central America. Central America, America. I've been to four or five of them. Okay. But I'm going, South America. Yeah, I'm going to Honduras too. I'm going to Honduras in like a month, I think. Still Central, right? Still Central, yeah, now South America. Okay. What else? Africa? Never been to Africa. This is basically I've, a pitch right now for anyone hosting Honda events in these countries I, to hit up Jason. <laughs> I've been invited to Africa twice, but the timing didn't work out. Where in Africa? Um, Saint something. Big scene out there? Um, supposedly, but I'm going to be honest with you guys. I went to, uh, New Zealand for an event. It was a great event. It just wasn't a real big scene. It wasn't as big as I thought it was going to be. How about Australia? Have you heard of big Honda, big Honda scene down there? I, I've heard of a Honda scene down there, but again, the problem there is it's massive. Too small. Yeah. yeah. A lot of these countries are split up into a West coast and East coast yeah. and they don't really talk to each other. Mm-hmm. They got just different sides. So no. it's really spread out there. I like, uh, we're talking about traveling. What are the perks of being a Honda brand advocate or just a brand advocate in general? So I get to see some insane things. Like I get to see, you know, collections of Hondas that no one ever gets to see. I get to see and meet people that people, you know, only read about in magazines, which is amazing for me. And the best part is I can share it with everybody. I can film it. I can go live. I can do things to share what I see with other people, which for me is the best part by far. I get invited to a lot of places that they don't want me to show. Like, hey, we want you to come out and see our collection, but no photos. I don't go. I was going to say, what's the, what's the point of you going? Why it's, would I go? Yeah. Like what? So I can go and be like, 
Hey, Frankie, hey, Brian, look what I saw. Ha, ha, ha. You guys didn't see it. I can't even show you what I What's thought. the point? Right. So I just don't go. And they're like, yeah, but we want to show you. I'm like, forget it. That's so not what I'm here for. That's not why I'm here. Right. That's not what I'm trying to do. Are these like collection, like who are private they? collection? Uh, sometimes private collection. Sometimes it's Honda. Oh. And they're like, hey, listen, we have a new product coming out. We want to show you early, but you can't show anyone. I don't want to see it. If my fans can't see it, I don't want to see it. It's not worth it. It just doesn't make sense to me. No benefit, right? Absolutely no benefit. This might be it, but what are the cons of being no, a Honda brand out of state? say city? that. Oh, uh, okay. So the number one con for me is not seeing my family. That's the toughest part. I travel an obscene amount. I mean, like more than I've any of my friends or anyone I know, I'm home once every week, maybe once every other week. Like I've literally, I've been on the road now for six days. I'm going to go home uh, tomorrow afternoon. So Thursday afternoon, then Saturday morning, I leave for Indonesia. I come home from Indonesia. I'm home for one afternoon and then I go to Toronto for four days. So I literally get to like high five my wife and my kids. I got two kids, a seven-year-old and 16-year-old. And I see them not that often. So that's really, that's the hard part. That's the con. Let's get into that. Yeah. For how long, 16-year-old son, right? Yeah. So has it been his entire life he was used to dad not being around? Pretty much. Pretty much. The seven year old. You hear it or they're just, they accept it? No, I mean, they accept it. They don't like it. You know, I'll get some, especially from the 16-year-old, I'll get some, yeah, but you're not here anyway. Yeah, but why does it matter? I'm like, I get it. I hear you. Uh, my seven-year-old has been his whole life. So when my wife was pregnant, we were talking to her OBGYN about the birth of my, seven, or my, my son, Maximus. And they're like, hey, listen, so we think the, well, the birth is going to be on January 8th. And I'm like, you know, that date doesn't work for me. I'm going to be at the Detroit Auto Show. And the doctor's like, there's my wife and goes, he's kidding, right? I go, no, I'm going to be at the Detroit Auto Show. So could we move the date? And she goes, well, we have to like do a C-section. And my wife with the previous child had a C-section. She goes, I'm okay with the C-section. And the doctor's like, you can't just pick your own date. Go, no problem. We'll go find a new doctor. So she goes to talk to her boss. She comes back. She goes, what date around that date do you want? I go, well, November 7th would work. It was my father's birthday. I'll always remember it. And that's the date I want. She goes, We'll do it on the 7th. So my wife gave birth to my son on the 7th. On the 8th, I left for Detroit to go work the auto show. Wow. Uh, it was for me, if I was going to make this work, I had to give it everything. And I always saw people, the most successful people in the world, gave everything. You know, the, the Michael Jordans. The, you know, I, I worked for a company that was owned by a man named Bob Rorman. He owns 32 dealerships. He gave everything to build his empire. It's not a side job. It's not a part-time thing. You know, you guys run your own business. There's things you have to give up. And that's, you know, part of it, unfortunately. What's on the other side? Like how, and you know, you kind of said it with your, your sons, but like, how does your wife take it? Like, is she very supportive or is there, you know, struggle sometimes when you leave? There, there's some struggles. Like my wife's very proud of me. She's very proud of what I built, but yeah, there's some struggles. There's women are different than men, right? So when I get home, Venus. when I, exactly, when I get home, I want to spend that, you know, 24 hours with her, like a hundred percent with her. And she goes, well, you're just going to leave in a little bit. Why should I be all lovey-dovey with you? You're just going to leave. Like, well, yeah, but we have this time. This is our time. So things have changed a little bit. I mean, it's gotten a little bit better. I've changed a lot. Uh, I did a podcast with uh, Downstar. You guys know Frank, right? I did a podcast with Downstar about five or six years ago. And I laid everything out, how I, you know, what I am with, how I am with my family and the kids. And I got a ton of backlash, a ton of your horrible father, family first. How dare you pick your, your job over your family, your career over your family. And at the time, I was trying to explain that my family's three people and me. And 
what I do is I entertain and educate and help hundreds of thousands or millions of people. It would be selfish of me to pick three people over millions. That's, that's the way I looked at it. And then I started thinking, I'm like, you know what? Maybe I can make this work both ways. So now when I travel, let's say I go to California for a meet on Saturday, Saturday afternoon or whatever the meet is, I would normally hang on California Saturday for the meet, Saturday night to go hang out, Sunday I'd recover, and then Monday I'd fly home. Now I fly home Sunday morning because I want to be with my family. So I've shortened a lot of that extra time to spend more time with my family. It's really worked out well. Very cool. Yeah. Good transition for you. Yeah, totally. Is that the only con of being a Honda brand advocate? I mean, it's tough sometimes because I'm an enthusiast, an automotive enthusiast. In general. In general. I've always been my whole life. My, my dad was a mechanic, turned into an uh, airplane mechanic. We've always been working on cars. My first car was not a Honda. You know, I've owned, you know, Cadillacs and Pontiacs and muscle cars and BMWs and a bunch of stuff before Honda. And I like other cars. And we're, we're sitting right next to this Viper. And can I appreciate the car? Yeah. Can I talk about it or do any, you know, anything on it? No. That kind of stinks a little bit. Because at the very beginning, when I first started this Honda thing, I knew it was only going to be Honda. And I remember one of the journalists came up to me that's been working in journalism forever. He goes, hey, let me give you a tip. If you want to make a career out of this, you got to do more than just Honda. I'm like, but that's my passion. Like, that's all I want to do. He goes, you better do something else. I'm like, you know, I don't think I want to make a career out of it. I just want to have fun. So I'm just going to do Honda. And now obviously I've turned it into a career. But would it be nice to cover other cars every so often? Sure. I get invited to a lot of events that only have like five or 10% Hondas there. And so I don't have a lot of work to do. I do the Hondas and they kind of walk around going, I can't really post anything else, so I, I guess I'm done. But you could just appreciate it without posting. I mean, I can appreciate other cars. I mean, they come across my radar. Would I own them? No. Would I talk about them? No. Would I suggest them to anyone else? You know, the, the GR Corolla over the Type R? Absolutely not. The Volkswagen Golf R over the Type R? No. Subaru? You know, I definitely know that Honda's at another level behind all those cars, but yeah, I guess that would be kind of a con. I could agree with that. So, you know, the, a lot of cons that, you know, are all, you know, obviously cons. I, I want to know how far do you think you're going to go in terms of, you know, not telling your age, but, you know, how, like, are what is the future of Honda mm -hmm. Pro, Jason? Is this forever for you, as long as you could go? Uh, it's forever. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely ever. So at the very beginning, I wanted everyone that knew the name Honda to know me and, and not, not just to be popular, but everyone that drives a Honda, I'd like them to better use their car. A lot of people drive cars, they drive them to and from work. They use the radio. They know how to put the car and drive. They know how to lock and unlock the doors. There's so much more to these cars. The features have so much more and the benefits have so much more. So if people knew how to really use their car, I think they'd enjoy it a lot more. It'd make their drives easier and more fulfilling. And so if they knew me and my videos, I could help them, you know, just drive better, strangely enough, but just lead a happier life with their car. Very cool. Do you ever see yourself not traveling as much anymore in the future? I do. So right before COVID, I had a plan and the plan was to hire other Honda pros. So a lot of what my job is, I go into dealerships, I train Honda salesmen on the technology of the car. It takes me usually a whole day for one dealership. There's a thousand dealerships. There's no way I can cover them all unless I had a team. So my idea was to hire a Honda Pro Frankie, a Honda Co. Brian. They would go into the dealerships. I would train them. They would train the salesmen at a discounted rate. And I would kind of manage the whole thing. Where are you getting your training from? Great Honda, question. Honda corporate? Uh, yes and no. So Honda treats me as a journalist. So when a new car comes out, the new Honda Accord comes out. They bring me with all the other journalists, you know, cars.com, car and driver, motor trend. We all meet up at wherever, California. And Honda shows us the car. There's some engineers there that I can ask some questions about it. I learn a lot from that. But then you know what I do? I read the owner's manual. That's you, it. You create your own training. I create my own training. But the owner's manual on these cars 
are usually about 700 to 800 pages. I read every single page and I go to a local Honda dealership and I borrow the car and I make my own walk around on my own training. Wow. So yeah, that's what I just did when I was at a dealership out in uh, New Jersey. I'll walk around the car with the first group of guys, it's three or four people, and they'll it's totally interactive. So they'll ask me all these questions as I'm doing my walk around. What's it like? What's an example of what of a question that? Um, what is the what's the difference between the radar in front of the car for Honda sensing and the camera? What does the camera do that the radar doesn't? And what does the radar do that the camera doesn't? Because they see them, and customers are like, "We understand Honda sensing." But what does the radar do? So I explained what the radar does and what the camera does. And then in the next training session, I include that in my training session because I know that's a question. So I'll do six. I just did six training sessions every day for three days. The first two or three training sessions, they asked a ton of questions. As I got to the fourth, fifth, and sixth, no more questions because I had already answered them all. Right. So I have different people in the training sessions. But because I answered the questions at the beginning and then included those questions in my walk around and in my training, they, I answered all their questions. So they just walked around and just learned from it. So what is the business of Honda Pro Jason? Do you fly to all these events? Yeah, I do. Great. But what is your business? How does Honda Pro Jason make money? I think you just described it. I, I train Honda salesmen. So these Honda dealerships hire you yes. to come. Wow. Okay. Yeah, they do, which was a problem with Honda for a little while. I was actually going to ask that. Does Honda corporate care? They do care. So Honda corporate, when you open up a dealership, part of the deal is Honda will train the salesman on the technology of the cars. That's part of the thing when you sign the contract. Because it sounds what you're doing sounds like something Honda corporate should be doing. It should be doing, right. 100%. So what happened at the very beginning when I started selling cars back in 96 is Honda would take the dealership and they'd fly or drive them to a location. And it was called a ride and drive. So the 1996 Accord, whatever, comes out, and they drive, they fly everyone to this one location, usually a racetrack, and they walk you around the cars. Big, all the dealerships go. Two, 300 people are there, right, in one area. And then they walk you around the cars. They bring you around the track. They tell you all about the cars. You go back all pumped up and ready to sell them. They did that for five or six years. And then they started s- setting product specialists into the dealership. And the product specialist would come in, not, he didn't work for Honda, but Honda gave him a list of items to cover when they were there. So they came in, they took the whole dealership, they're like, hey guys, we're going to talk about the new Odyssey. Okay, cool. Teach us everything. They went over like four or five of the high points and that was it. And, and if you ask them any questions, hey, Honda Sensing, what does your radar do? They'd say, let me look that up and I'll get back to you. And they never got back to you because mm. they didn't work for Honda and they went to the next dealership. Then, then it just turned into where it is right now, basically is how did dealership reps come into the dealership and they're like, hey guys, let me tell you a little bit about the car. And then they're done. It might take them 15, 20 minutes. I go in there and I do my training in small groups of three to four people. My training takes about an hour to an hour and a half for each group. So Honda had contacted me one time like, hey, where are that you're charging dealerships to do training? I go, I am. They're like, well, we're offering training for free. I'm like, cool. Why do you think they're hiring me then? They go, we don't know. That's what we want to find out. And we'll come out to one of my trainings. He said, sure. So they sent the guy out and he sat through my whole training class. At the end, I go, what'd you think? He goes, that was incredible. And so Honda reaches out to me and like, hey, so our guy was really impressed with everything you did. I go, great. I go, what do you guys think? They go, enjoy it. We can't do that. We have a thousand dealerships. It would take us forever to do that kind of training with every single one of them. What year was this? 17. So I, I, I would love for every Honda salesman to get the training like I give them. Because in almost all of my training sessions, keep in mind that these are salesmen that have been selling these cars for, I don't know, 10, 15, 18 years. There were three salesmen at the dealership I was just at. At the end of my training session, they looked at me and they said, I want to buy this car. I had no idea this car could do this much stuff. I want to buy it. You know how powerful it is? A salesman? Yeah. So it's, it's crazy. So it's stuff that they need. And it's so empowering it's, the salesman. Totally. So in my mind, I'm empowering them so they can educate other people and sell more cars and feed their family 
and more people can be in Hondas and better understand the technology in the cars. Do you ever, like, I guess at one point, have you ever seen yourself working for Honda corporate? And is that still a goal today? So here's the problem with working for Honda corporate. I couldn't be sitting here with you guys talking about it. I didn't have to get there okay. And then before you guys could air this podcast, they'd have to look at it and make sure it was okay. Corporate red tape. I don't have time for that. I don't really care. I'd rather do my own thing. If I want to take a picture of a Civic I see on the street from my car while I'm driving, I'll take that picture. I'll post it up on my social media, spotted this car. If I work for Honda Corporate, they'd say, hey, you can't take pictures while you're driving. You can't post that photo. You can't do this. You can't do that. I, I don't want to do that. It doesn't make sense to me. So the future of the brand and the future of Jason yeah. is not working for Honda. No, I, I won't work for the company. I'll work with them. Yes. I love them, but I, work, I won't work for them. I don't think it would benefit them or me. All of a sudden, if I'm a corporate employee, how are people going to look at me? They're going to look at me like a corporate employee, not like an enthusiast. And I'm an enthusiast. I want people to look at me as an enthusiast. You need that, se you need that separation. Totally. Trying to show that it's not Hada speaking for Hada. It's somebody that loves Hada speaking about Hada. Exactly. Very cool. So the future of the Honda Pro Jason empire is making and creating an army of Honda Pro. Is that still the plan? That is still the plan. So is this like a, a should we put up like a, a posting here on, on this podcast? Apply to be a Honda Pro by DMing <laughs> Honda Pro Jason. Every dealership I go to, there's always a guy that pulls me aside and goes, hey, I want to do what you do. I love technology. I don't want to sell cars forever. If you ever need help, let me know. So you got it. You got it. I got a list. You got I got a list. But if somebody's listening to this and is interested, they well, can yeah. add to the list. Add to the list. So that's that's step one. Step two is building Chevy Pros, Dodge Pros, Kia Pros, Hyundai Pros. Because all these brands need it, right? Yeah. Of technology. Yeah. If you guys have walked into a dealership, I guarantee, unless you got real, real lucky, the salesman's like, Oh, cool. Okay, Brian. Nice to meet you. My name's Jason. What are you driving? Oh, you got this Viper? Let me get some numbers on the Viper. Here are the keys to the new car. Come back and let me know what you think. I'll put numbers together. What? That's it? Actually, Jason, I, I'll tell you, I won't mention the dealership, yeah. but I bought the 2023 Acura MDX. Okay. I went to the dealership. He said, he gave me the keys. Mm -hmm. He said, go ahead and test drive it. Mm -hmm. I test drove it by myself. And I said, okay, I want, you know, figured out what the price was. And I said, okay, I'll take it. The car came back. He sat in the car. He set up my Bluetooth and, and walked away. That's unacceptable to you. A hundred percent. And this is why. The reason I have a problem with that is you might be different because you're an enthusiast, but most customers will use their Bluetooth, their FM radio, maybe XM, and they'll drive the car. Then in three to five years later, they're going to trade the car in to buy something else. They can buy anything out there because all cars are going to have Bluetooth and XM radio. But if I show them everything the car does, like your car is um, key fobs one and two. Yep. I didn't know that. So okay. you know what? Oh, I, oh, I got <laughs> Let's get into this because I don't know. I got tons. So, of so educate I, me because I don't know. I didn't know. So yes, key fob one and two. Yeah. So I would go, I had a drawer. I just throw the key in and I would grab the key. I get in the car. Why the hell don't the door locks lock? No, no, no. Why is my seat moving? Oh, and it's not my preset. Every time I got in my car, I'm like, all right. Oh, so the preset I find out when the you hit the lock. one, mm -hmm. it is attached to key fob number one. Oh. So every time I would grab key fob two, it was my wife's. Yes, I get so I'm like, this is fucked up. Yeah. It's broken. I have a car <laughs> that does not work. That's the beginning. Lemon law. So you're familiar <laughs> with the way the doors lock and unlock in your car, right? Yeah. You can grab the door handle. Yep. Do you know you can choose what doors unlock? What when you, you grab the door handle, you can choose yeah. your lock, your lock or, open or all the doors. Yep, I do know that. When you put the car in park, you can choose what doors unlock. When you put the car in drive, you can choose what doors unlock. When you walk away from the car, you can choose for the car to automatically lock. This is like a setting you know in, the, in the. There are. I wish I brought it with me because, bro, I would go through it my old, my old MDX. Yeah, I had it set where I walk away and it automatically locks. Yep. The new one, I can't find that setting. I I can find it for you. 
I just Except, I didn't bring it with me. Bro, I can walk you through it on the phone. Right. It's so easy. Okay. So it, walk me through it because I have no idea what you guys are talking about. So, Neither the people listening. So this Let the Honda Pro tell us. We don't want to hear it from Francis, who doesn't know the difference between key fob one and two. Uses as well. No, I want to hear it. I'm telling you, stop. I want to hear it from the Honda Pro. Stop talking. Honda Pro, tell us. He didn't know the difference between one and two. He keeps on talking. He keeps on talking. My 2019 MDX had this feature where you walk away from the car and you don't have to lock it. You just walk away from the car and it automatically locks itself. Walk away out of lock. Yes. Your new car has it. I was looking for it. You, I couldn't find it. You, you can't find it because you're looking under keyless entry settings. There it's it's actually on their door and window setup. So that could be why. See, the guy who wants to keep on talking didn't know this. That's why we want to well, talk to Honda Pro. What most people don't know is all the stuff we've talked about is separate for key fob one and two. So you can set up key fob one to do all that. To do all that the way you want it to. So you grab the door handle. So it's you and your wife, right? Yeah. When your wife grabs the door handle, she might just want just her door to open for safety. You want all the doors open. You can separate that between key fob one and key fob two. No one knows that. That's the kind of stuff I show people. And that's the kind of stuff that in three years, when you use all that, there, there's something called preset door locks, which you have on your car. The way that works is, what kind of car you got, Brian? My Ram 1500 outside. Okay. So when you leave your car and you got, you got the family with you, you have to tell the family, hey, get out of the car so I can lock it. Get out, shut the door so I can lock it. Because you can't lock it when the doors are open, right? With the Hondas, you can now. It's a preset lock function. So what you do is you get out of the car, you shut the door. The kids and everything open up the doors. You press the lock and you walk away. It's presetting the lock. So whenever they shut the door, the door's locked. Five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, two hours, five hours. Whenever they get, get out of the car and shut the door, so they're in there on their phones and they're changing diapers, whatever they're doing, you're ready in the store. You're ready anywhere you want to go. You're out of range. Those doors shut. The doors automatically lock. Cause we could just come out. All these settings that you're talking about are like in the radio settings, like yeah, in your dash. Infotainment system. Right. Yeah. What, what year did that feature come out? 2023. Oh, okay. Brand new. Okay. I, I'm sorry, 2023 in a Honda. Okay. How about Acura? I don't know. I'm not Acura Pro. Okay. And there's a reason for that. So <laughs> tell us why. I had a meeting with Acura about... Four years ago, I flew out to California to meet one of the heads of Acura. I'm like, hey, listen, I would do some work with you guys just like I do with Honda. Like, you know, we'd love to have you. I go, so why don't we do something? They're like, well, we'd love to have Jason Richmond, which is my last name, kind of no one really knows, but we don't want Honda Pro Jason. Like, well, they're the same person. Like, well, they're not. We don't want Honda Pro Jason doing Acura stuff. So this is what we want to do. We think that you, sh you should remarket yourself and add Acura Pro. New Facebook, new Instagram, new Yelp page, new Twitter, new YouTube. I go, you guys are crazy. I'm going to rebrand all those channels. You know how much work and money that is? You know what he told me? He said, we did it back in 1985. Oh, when they created Acura. When they Acura. created Acura. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew when, like... Did you just hear what you said? You're a billion dollar company right. You're comparing it to me. So I don't do Acura. But five minutes ago, you just said you want to do Ford Pro, Kia Pro. I don't want to do it. I think there's a need for it. Uh -huh. And I'd own or manage the company and have professionals go out there and do all that for sure. Individuals that know, Individuals that, know that product. So you want, you want Mazda Pro Nick. Mazda Pro Nick has a great ring to it. But because you're the Honda Pro, you can't have a connection to There's got to be a, a... It would be an umbrella. I was going to say, what's the, day, what's like the umbrella? Auto Pro. Auto Pro. Auto Pro. Auto Pro's probably taken. I would have to find out a name. Obviously, Honda Pro probably wouldn't work. Yeah. because But I'd have to come up with a name an and put all the pro... Yeah, yeah. An umbrella. Umbrella. Yeah. Okay. So the future of Honda Pro is being a subsidiary of this, whatever this is. Wh whatever. Something pro. Something pro, yeah. yeah. So back to your point, Frankie, is that if you know everything that your Acura can do, you know Key 5 wanted to, you know walk away out of lock, you know the presetting, you know all the cool stuff your XM radio can do, which I can show you 10 things you had no idea XM could even do. 
you know, Apple CarPlay, you know, AccuraLink. AccuraLink is insane. Yep. It'll change your life if you know all that stuff. In three to five years, when you're ready for your next car, there's only one choice. Because Ford doesn't do it, Chevy doesn't do it, Mazda doesn't have any of the features Honda or Acura has. That's what I'm trying to show people. If people use the car to its fullest and really enjoy the features the car has, they'll continue to buy, they'll continue to buy it forever. End of story. That's it. So I got a funny story here. Exactly what you said of not using your car to the fullest. My wife has a 2012 Acura TSX wagon. And literally two weeks ago, I get a call from her and he's like, she's like, something's wrong with the car. I walked up to it and all the windows were down. Yeah. I was like, what do you mean? She's like, literally all the windows are down. Like, I don't know if somebody broke into it. Like the car is fine. Just all the windows are down. And I know from having an infinity in the past, if you hit the, um, the lock, lock, if you hold the lock button down for the infinities, okay. all the windows come down. So I told her, I was like, I think there's a feature in your car. And I Googled it real quick as we were on the phone. I was like, yeah, I forget if you hit it twice. On hit, the, unlock twice and hold it. Right. Windows going on, sunroof opens up. So she was just quiet. And then she, I guess she was trying it and she's like, whoa. <laughs> so funny story about that is that Honda's had that feature since 2012. Well, there you go. The problem is a lot of people called and complained and said, my windows are down. It rained that day. I don't know what happened. My windows came down. I got message after message after message saying, can't Honda put a on off switch on that? I'm like, sure they can. I kept telling the engineers, you need to put an on off switch, you need to put an on off switch. Guess what started in 2023? Oh, right. An on off switch. Now you can shut that feature off. Did you know your Honda could, your Acura could do that? Yeah, if you just press unlock once, unlock again, and hold it, all the windows go down and the sunroof opens up. In the United States of America and Canada, the only way to close it is take separate the key from the key fob, put the key in the door, turn it to a lock position once, and again, and hold it. That'll close all the windows. In every other country, you can press the lock button and it closes the windows. Not in America. And this is the reason why. This is why. If we do that to your car that's sitting outside and we can't see it, and the windows are down, and you close the window, and you got your dog in there, Kevin, it out. or you got your kids in there. Yeah, in and like a, it's not like a garage door where it's like, oh, no, 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 you're in it. And what are we going to do? We're going to sue Honda. In Europe and Asia, when they do it, they know they screwed up. They're not going to sue the company. That's not their style. Uh -huh. So Honda allows that in other countries and doesn't allow it in this country. That's crazy. Totally crazy. That's crazy. So the window down trick, you have key fob one and key fob two. Frankie, you can shut that off for your wife, but keep it for yourself. That's cool. My mind has blown. And that was, again, one of the features we, I never knew Acura's could do that. Like right. I, I knew the Infinity could do that because I read the manual back of to course. front. But that's another thing. I haven't read the manual for the for the Acura. You have to. There's so many things that vehicle, even in 2012, there's so many things that vehicle could, could do that you didn't know. Give me give me and, one thing that the the coolest thing that car could do that I probably don't know. I just like the door lock settings. I, I just think the door lock settings, you know. I didn't know it could do that. You, what, you guys were talking about that. I was like, what? Are you yeah, we reach a certain mile an hour, like nine or 10 miles an hour. All the doors will lock. And that's something that you're saying I, is done in the infotainment. So in 2012, I have to check because when I started learning about all these features, there was no infotainment and you used to do it through the door lock settings. So if you want to change the way the doors lock, it was some crazy combination. Like up, 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 down, up, down, down, down like left, right, it left, right. Open door, emergency <laughs> break up, close door, press break, put car in neutral, press it all the door lock for five seconds. This is in the manual? Yeah, it's in the manual. Wow. And I was one of the few people that I know that ever knew how to do that because no one reads the manual. Even like turning off the, uh, like the, what is that, the service light. With the, before the infotainment, there was like a trick. You had to hold the key down and stuff like that. So we just did it, right? The up, down, left, right, left, right. That's Contra, right? Yep. So anyone who had Nintendo played Contra, everybody knew that was the code, right? And that was the coolest code because it was unlimited, unlimited life. Was it unlimited life or unlimited bullets? No, life. Life? Yes. All right. It's funny. I know the code, right? But what does it do? You didn't even know what it does. What is... I'm going to restart this. Because you're the Honda Pro, 
what is the coolest secret thing that Honda does? And it could be any car. Okay, so there's what one, one. There's a video game that's built in to the ridge line of the pilot of the last generation. It was a it was a jelly bean game. So in, in the navigation. In the in the infotainment. In the infotainment. So the infotainment was done by Android. Android put a jelly bean game in the infotainment system of the Hondas. How do they access this game? So ooh, it was, I believe, you went to you had to go to settings, you went to system settings, then went down to about. And I think you tapped on about, and then the screen would come on, and then you'd press and hold the screen with your finger, it would turn into the jelly bean game. How did people who were supposed to find out about this? I'm trying to remember how I found out. I found out. I found out because someone sent me a message saying, hey, I heard they're using jelly bean as an operating system in the in the pilot and the ridgeline. I go, I, I think so. I'm not sure what that means. They're like, well, there's a game in the jelly bean for the phone, for the Android phones. See if the game's in the car. I checked and it was in the car. But how did you find it in that menu? Because it was, oh, either it was the same way on the phone or someone gave me some ideas or I was playing with it. Somehow I came across it. I don't remember that, how. That is pretty cool. So what, what's the ridgeline? The ridgeline. Which generation? And the pilot. The last, the first generation. The last generation. No, I'm sorry. This generation uh, before the upgrade. All right, what year? What year is this? Since I'm unfamiliar with those two platforms. 2013, 2012, 2013, 2014. The crazy part about this story is that I did a video on this. And then about four or five months later, I'm at the Detroit Auto Show. And a guy comes up to me and goes, hey, I want to introduce myself. My name's Mark, whatever his name was. I'm the lead engineer for the infotainment system of the Ridgeline and the Pilot. I do it. Great to meet you. He goes, I had no idea that Jelly Bean game was in. What? <laughs> what? No way. He goes, you show me. He goes, and my mind was blown. No. They, How? They snuck it in. And I thought he was going to go, hi, my name is Mark Jelly Bean. No. <laughs> what? Android snuck it in and they never knew about it. So this is, is this on your YouTube? Uh, it's, yeah, you can see it on my YouTube channel. Okay. I feel, if that's something that should have gone so viral. What can I search? Honda Pro Jelly Bean? Yeah, you can look Jelly Bean Game Honda. Okay. It'll pop up. Some other people have caught on to it recently and reposted it. In fact, Honda reposted it not too long ago that the game was in there. Nice. So that's that started this whole thing with hiding stuff in Hondas. And then Honda started hiding stuff in their own inventory system, which is kind of cool. So they started hiding stuff after someone else hit something in their system. So let's call, they're truly called Easter eggs, right? Yeah, they're called Easter eggs, sure. So that's a, it's pretty old, 2012, 2013, yeah. over 10 years ago, a decade ago. Yeah. What is the coolest Easter egg in the new generation of Hondas? So. Meaning. Let, let me give you, let me give you. It's the, a secret, but you have to find it. I think one of the coolest things they did was. On the Civic, two doors and four doors of the 10th generation. What year is that? Uh, that started in... Is that the EM one? No, 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 no. EM one's uh, way back in many generations. This should be 2016. Be the first one. And then up until, not the hatchbacks, only the coupes and the four doors. Okay. So Honda put something in a spill mat inside the armrest. When you lifted up the spill mat, it showed uh, pictures of old generation Civics. Oh, that's cool. But they had four different ones. They had some that had Osimo in there, generations of Civics in there. One had the Honda Jet in there. Uh, some had motorcycles in there. It was kind of like baseball cards. You didn't know which one you were going to get. It was totally random. Armrest. Um, inside the armrest, on the very bottom, there's a spill mat. You pull the mat out and you see it on the bottom. It's on the bottom of the mat. On the bottom of the mat. So Is it yeah. like printed on it? Oh, uh, it's embossed. Whoa. So it's really cool. So here's the crazy part. I go to the UK to watch my own car being built. So I bought an FK8. I flew out to the UK to watch it being built. As far as I know, I'm the only person to ever watch their own Honda being built. That factory is shut down now. So I'll probably be the only one to ever watch their Type R being built. So I'm out there talking to them. I'm like, hey, listen, I'm curious. 
you guys make all the hatchbacks for America, like just we do. I go, why is the Easter egg not in the hatchbacks? It's only in the two doors and four doors. They looked at me and they go, what Easter egg? I'm like, you're <laughs> kidding me. So I show them the video. Yeah. And they're like, oh my God, we had no idea America even did that. Like we had no concept they were putting those in the car. They never even told us. There's Easter eggs that Honda doesn't even know. Honda didn't even know about yeah, the like Easter egg. So that's one of my favorite ones. Now I have one that's my least favorite one. All right, hold on. Jason. I like that. What's your least favorite Easter egg? That's a great question. In any generation of Honda. That sounds amazing. So the new Civic has an Easter egg. Um, like a 23. 23. It's either on the, the bottom of the spill mat or in the coin tray. Including the Type R? Um, Not including. Including the Type R. Yeah, including the Type R. So on the coin tray, if you flip it over, it says the Civic history continues. And there's a picture of a first-gen Civic. It's super cool. Just a little something. It's not a piece of plastic again embossed. I'm like, man, that's super, super cool. So the Integra comes out. And the Integra essentially is very similar to the Civic. So I'm like, oh man, I'm like, I hope they did an Easter egg in this. I can't wait to see the Easter egg in this. So I go to a dealership, pull up a new Integra. I pull out the coin tray, I flip it over. You know what it says? The Civic history continued. Oh, they, they used the same. <laughs> they didn't even know it was there. Oh. So I show oh, it. Because they just took the same coin just tray. Took, yeah. The whole center council yeah. is the same. Yeah. They used all the part numbers and just moved it in the Integra yeah. without even thinking about it. So I post this online. Yeah. It goes viral. I get a message from Acura corporate, oh, pissed. pissed at themselves, not at me. They we saw the video, we showed it in a couple of meetings. People are in a lot of trouble. Somebody got fired. I go, do me a favor. You're going to change it. They're like, oh yeah, we're going to change it. I go, don't make it blank. You're going to miss a, a big opportunity. Make sure you put like a first gen Acura Integra in there or something. Make it cool for people. Because their idea was probably just to erase it, which I think is a missed opportunity. Do the FK8 Civic Type R's have any Easter eggs? Yeah. Outside of the... Uh... Well, no, that's not in the FK8 because it's the hatchback. Okay. So I, I will tell you, my FK8 had it. So I was at a demo drive for a new Civic. I think it was the Civic Coupe that came out or something. And it had the Easter egg. And my car doesn't have the Easter egg. So I took mine out of my car. But how'd you know it existed if yours didn't have it? So because the coupes came out first. Okay. The coupe and the four-door came out in 2016. My car came out in 2000. Oh, so you checked yours and you're like, okay, mine doesn't have it. Yeah, because none of the hatchbacks had it, which okay. surprised me. So I took mine out, I brought it to this event, and I pulled one out of a car that was there, and I autographed it, and I said, Honda for Jason was here. And I put it back in the car, and I took the one that was in Boston, brought it into my car. So there's a car out there somewhere with my autograph on it that has no embossing, but it has my autograph. So this is for your FK8. That was for my FK8. So yeah, I don't really on now. I'm trying to remember if there's an actual Easter egg in my car, and I don't think there is. So in general, though, the FK8 doesn't have any Easter eggs, like across all FK8s. I don't think so. But, sorry, I got confused. So what about the new Type R, FL5? FL5 has one. Oh. FL5 has it. What is the Easter egg in the FL5, Civic Type R? That's the the Civic history continues. Okay. So that's the one in the uh, coin tray. In the coin tray. You flip the coin tray over, you'll see it. So literally pull out the coin tray, take out the insert. Uh, so there's no insert. You literally take the coin oh, the tray. the coin tray comes out. Yeah, you lift it up. You flip it over. It's plastic. Okay. And the other side, it says it right on there. I'm curious if the FK8 or FL5 have any digital Easter eggs. That... So here's what happened. I was looking at the new Honda HRV. They flew me out to California to go look at it. And I'm talking to the guys about it. And I was like, hey, listen, you know, I pulled one of the engineers over from Japan. And I'm like, uh, you know, talking to him. I go, you know who I am? Like, we know who you are. What do you think of the car? I tell him everything I think of the car, what I like, what I don't like about it. I go, are there any Easter eggs? He goes, what do you mean? I go, you know what I mean? Are there any hidden secrets? He goes, did you find one? I go, no. He goes, you should look. I go, so is there one? He goes, I cannot say. So next morning I get up super early, like five in the morning, I go through the entire car. Can't find anything. 
I'm looking and looking and looking, can't find anything. So I go to see him at breakfast that, that morning. I'm like, hey, I've been looking for Easter eggs. He goes, we had a meeting and we thought you'd be looking. Here's a card. If you find one, you call this number. Swear to God, I have not found it yet. No one in the country has found it. No one in the world has found it. But why would he give me a card and tell me if I find it to tell him and tell him, tell me that he had a meeting talking about me and Easter eggs about it. It has to be in there. This is like the Willy Wonka golden ticket. Right. I would love to find, I've spent hours. You check under the map? To, I've checked under, I've taken apart everything. I've gone through the entire system. I don't think there's anything else I could do, but sometimes it's like, you know, hold three buttons together and a funny picture will pop up or. that. That's a tough one to find. It's, it's going to be, t I'm going to find it. You might try just, is there an up, down, left, right, left, right? I mean, <laughs> maybe I should try the Contra thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what this is? You're making this sound like, uh, actually one of my favorite movies is a uh, National Treasure, mm. the uh, City of Gold. That's cool. Kind of like, does it exist? I don't know. We'll never know. Maybe that card is something. Maybe you got to insert it somewhere. Maybe you need a black light to the card like they did in the movie to the back of the independent. I, I should go look at that yeah, card. Yeah, the back of the card with the black light. Yeah. It's there. It's like, open the glove box. Right. No, not only that. I think in the movie they had to drop some lemon on it. Maybe. Uh, black light first, black lemon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, something okay, like okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give it a shot. Yeah, but could I give my personal opinion on, on why I think he gave you that card? For the same reason that the uh, engineer for the navigation system didn't know that that jelly bean was in there i think they're just sending you on a um open-ended uh treasure hunt here in which they're probably they they had a joke between each other like yo this <laughs> this guy found something that nobody at this table knew do you think he's gonna find something and they're like ask him ask sure. him to go I, find something yeah he I'm probably pre will Oh my God. That's and they probably got a bet between each other. Like, will they find if it? If he finds something, you know, like, who thinks Jason's actually going to find something? You, know what you, should do? you should just call the number. Just call the number. Found it. And say, I found it. Found it. Yeah. I found it. And then hang up. Hang up. That's funny. That's now the ball's in their court. Yeah. I see what happened. And then you ask them, what do you think I found? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Can I can I post what I found? Oh, yeah. So I that conversation I have with Honda often. Oh, that's so a good one. I posted some stuff back when the CRV was going to be turbocharged about a year. So the CRV is turbocharged now, one point five liter turbo. About a year before they introduced that engine, I heard a rumor that they were going to go turbo. And I was so excited. I did a video and said, "Hey, listen, guys, I got some big news. The CRV." Is going to go turbocharged and it's going to be have this and this and all these features, all this kind of stuff. And I was super excited, right? Because that's big news. Honda contacts me and they're like, hey, listen, um, you really screwed up. What do you mean? Like, you can't say that. I go, why? They're like, you're killing our sales. I go, what are you talking about? And they explained to me that when I made the announcement, many people want to wait for the new car because it was turbocharged. Right. Not just because of my announcement, but you guys watch my show. You guys heard my announcement. You tell all your friends and relatives, yeah. stop. Don't buy that CRV. Yeah. Wait for the turbo one. It's going to be better. Mm. So then that becomes a huge thing. Yeah. They sat down and they talked to me like, hey, listen, we had to put money back on the current CRVs to sell them wow. because you're a video. Wow. I'm like, oh shit. They're like, you cost us a lot of money. Wow. And that's not my intention. My intention is not to hurt that brand. Right. And I freaked out. I was like, oh. I go, if anything crazy like that happens, I'm going to contact you guys first before I do it. Before I make any big, huge, monumental announcements, wow. I'll tell you first. Wow. So this leads me up into the FL5, which is a new Civic Type oh, R. Sorry, going yeah. back, right? So yeah, yeah. You announced that. Yeah. You know, the one thing that I was disappointed though was, yeah, it's turbo, but CVT transmission. That that disappointed it, it, me. It has a CVT, which I <laughs> they 
it it's not like a regular you know gear transmission like you know to be able to it's it's not but why does that disappoint you it disappoints me because i am a auto enthusiast that likes to feel a car go through its gears i i totally understand that they need cvts for gas mileage right so and, and, and i i understand why they went turbo for for gas mileage as well but when i heard that news of going turbo because because of me being an auto enthusiast, I'm like you were excited. I was excited yeah. to know that I was going to feel the boost in my right. RV. Well, you're get, you're really not going to feel it with a CVT transmission. That that was one thing that kind of brought me down with that. I hear you. Engineering versus yeah, totally get it. I mean, it's more for efficiencies, right? And you know, now these days, especially with the EPA and stuff like that, I I get it. But coming from an enthusiast, yeah, I was disappointed. How does hanging on? I mean, how does hanging on to the manuals as much as they can? They're hanging on to their 10 speed transmission. Yeah. They still have it in a lot of their cars. So that helps. Yeah. Sorry, I broke. You were going or you were like going? The FL. FL5. FL5. Yeah. So new Civic Type R is announced. They have it all wrapped up, right? It's wrapped up. It's all, all the windows are dark. You can't see anything. It's got that crazy Type R wrap on it. And no one can see anything. And then at the Indy 200 in Ohio, they're going to show it for the very first time, I think, unwrapped. And they invited me and some other enthusiasts out there. I'm like, oh, man, this could be awesome. I asked him before I start, can I show everything on the car underneath? Uh, they're like, yeah, you just can't show the inside. It's still tinted, but just don't put your camera right to the window. We want to show the inside yet. Basically, because it wasn't finished and they didn't want people to see an unfinished inside. Cool. I respect that. No problem. I won't do that. But everything else you're good with. Yep, everything else we're good with, no problem at all. Awesome. So I film everything, including the VIN number, because I want to know what the chassis code is, because we're huge on chassis codes, right? I see the chassis code is FL5. No one's talked about it. I'm like, bro, this this is it. So I tell him, and I, you know, I'm going through everything, and one of the guys comes over and goes, It's okay, but I saw you take pictures of the VIN number. I go, Yeah. They're like, why? I go, I want to look at the chassis code. He goes, What's that? I, it's the code that everyone kind of calls the car. Like the old one was FK8. He goes, yeah, I know that, but what does it have to do with the VIN number? The chassis code's in the VIN number. They're like, oh, okay, show me. So I show him. He's like, oh, that's kind of cool. So this is the FL5. I go, yeah. He goes, okay, cool. I just wanted to know. He walks away. Cool. So I get my post ready. about to post everything. And come he goes, stop, stop, stop. I go, what? He goes, I talked to Honda Corporate and they don't want you to post that yet. They want to make the announcement. Cool. I'm not going to take their thunder. Yeah. Do I make the announcement? Make the announcement. That could have gone bad. Could have gone really bad. Yeah. Fast forward to the unveiling. Actually, I think the car was still wrapped. You fast forward to the unveiling about six or eight weeks later in California. They have the car. Oh, I'm sorry. When I was done, they put tape over the VIN number so no one could see it. So they could protect it. Cool. Right. Fast forward to California. I'm out there for the official unveiling of the car. They had the Honda Jet there. They had a bunch of FL5s there. They got music and, and burgers and everything and you got to mention the burgers well yeah in and out it was it was good no it was good it was good so they had like a, a food truck in and out food truck anyway so i looked there eh. the car's there and the vin number's exposed so i go up to one of the people in pr i go hey listen about the vin number they're like yeah we were going to talk to you about that i go yeah did you hear what happened in ohio yeah we heard what happened in ohio and at the time, we wanted to make the announcement. But then we talked about it. And you know what? We don't really care. It doesn't really mean anything to us anyway. I go, okay. Like, that's a huge thing. For you to be able to break it. Oh, yeah. yeah. For the enthusiasts, yeah, yeah. everyone looks at that car. They go, that's an FL5. Yeah. That's an FK8. Yeah. So I break the news. It's an FL5. And everyone goes crazy. But it was just funny that Honda thought it was a big deal. And, and then later, true. they're like, we don't really care. Because... Okay. I mean, naturally, at this point, you you have a kind of, uh, I guess, a red light on you. Like, everybody keep your eyes on this guy. We need him, but we just got to we gotta be a little cautious around him. 100%. Right. I'm okay with that, though. I get it. So, yeah. Man, that's crazy. So, I actually meant to ask you this question. Yeah. I don't know if you already said it. What's the most unexpected thing that happened to you? in your career being a Honda brand advocate. This is awesome. Okay, so uh, this is 
2014, 2015, I'm at an event called NADA, which is a National Dealers Association event where dealership owners and GMs, they all meet up and people try to sell them everything. It's a huge convention. They sell them everything from flooring to car washes to computer systems, like everything out there. And Honda is there. Honda does something called the Make Meeting, which is like a Honda meeting just for dealerships. You know, no public's allowed. Uh, usually no journalists are allowed. So I get invited in, not by Honda, but by dealership. Kind of under the radar. I go in and I'm, you know, just sitting there listening to everybody. Uh, how, how, how are you going under the radar? Yeah. <laughs> so this sounds like a mission of you wear a movie and wear a week. I wasn't supposed to be there. I kind of knew I wasn't supposed to be there. I kind of walked in the side and sat down. I didn't make a big deal out of it. And then some of the dealership owners saw me and like, hey, you're Honda Pro Jason. Can I take a picture? My guys are never going to believe I met you. Sure. So we start taking pictures and it becomes kind of a big thing. And then the president of Honda, okay, Mr. Yamada. Yeah, Mr. Yamada comes over to me. He goes, hi, I'm Mr. Yamada. It was nice to meet you. He goes, I'm the president of Honda US. I'm like, I know who you are. And he's like, who are you? I, I, I go by Honda Pro Jason. I'm a Honda brand advocate. I do YouTube. He goes, YouTube, give me your YouTube. How can I watch your videos? So I give him the information and I thought that was awesome. End of story. Next day, I see him on the floor. He notices me. He goes, Jason. I go, Mr. Yamada, how are you? He goes, I'm in the know. I go, <laughs> no. He goes, smells like Honda. He starts quoting all of my quotes from my videos. He goes, I sat up all night watching your videos. I go, no way. He goes, I'm very impressed. We need to work together. Niles. Yeah, like, I need to work with you. This would be amazing. I was just starting. I'm like, this is unbelievable. Nice. He goes, are you going to be in Detroit for the auto show? I go, I will be in Detroit. He goes, I'm going to introduce you to uh, Robin Eagles, which is the head of PR once we get there. Cool. So I get there. I look all over for him. I look for him. I see him. I go, hey, Mr. Mata. He goes, oh, hey, how are you? Good, good. He goes, I'm going to find Robin. He finds Robin. He goes, Robin, this is Honda Pro Jason. Anything he needs, you give him. Bro, this is awesome. What year is this? Uh, 2014. Nice. Maybe 15. So he leaves. And Rob was like, you know, it's nice to meet you. Let me get your contact info. You know, if there's anything you need. I go, actually, I heard you guys are doing a, a press drive for the journalist for the new Honda HRV, which is the first generation HRV. So it's 2015, I think, 14. And she goes, yeah, we're doing one in Miami, but it's full. I go, this is my time, right? Mm -hmm. Did you hear what your boss just said? He said, anything I want. She goes, I have one opening that they haven't confirmed yet. Here's one of the magazines. If they don't confirm by midnight tomorrow, you can get their spot. I'm like, oh man, this is it. This is it. This is it. Yeah. Midnight tomorrow comes around, passes. She calls me the next day. She goes, they didn't take it. It's all yours. Yes. So probably one of my most memorable times is when I met him. Right. I just totally changed the course of everything on Pro Jason. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. Oh, that is memorable. Yeah. Have you ever met the uh, president of Honda in Japan? Yes, a couple times. He knows. Uh, is he in the know? He's He is also in the know, yes. So um, Honda's presidents, they've gone through three or four in Japan since I've started Honda Pro Jason. Met so him. I've met three of them. One of them, I actually opened up a dealership. I went to a grand opening of a dealership in Guatemala with one of them. Guatemala has one of the largest dealerships in the world. Like literally you went there with him? I was there and he flew in. I didn't fly in the plane. I was going to say, did you did you get to ride the jet with him? I, I've, I've flown the jet. We'll talk about that in a minute. You write that down on that little piece of paper. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Tell me about the Honda jet and how you I'm flew it. That's, that here. A, that's okay. a great story. So I'm in Guatemala and I'm visiting Guatemala for an event called Honda Fest. I go out there totally surprised hundreds and hundreds of cars. I never thought there'd be more than 10 out there. At the end, this one guy goes, hey, you should go see the dealership. I work there. I go, uh, okay, I have a little bit of time. So I go to see the dealership and the dealership's okay. Like it's nothing special, but it's a nice dealership. A lot of Honda love, a lot of pictures of Mr. Honda everywhere. And I'm like, this is really cool. He goes, we're building a bigger one. I go, cool, but 
I have to jump on a plane. Like I have to be at the airport in about 45 minutes and the airport is about half hour away. He goes, the dealership we're building is going to be the biggest in the world. It's eight stories tall. I go, how fast can we get there? <laughs> He's like, I have an Integra type R. He goes, we can get there really quick. I go, let's go. So we race over there. Five minutes later, we arrive. It's DC2? Uh, DC2. All under construction. So I don't know if you've seen the video. It's the guy that owns like seven or eight right-hand drives. He's got a first-gen Civic that was supercharged. First-gen Civic. 75, I think. Wow. This car was supercharged at the dealership back in 75. Wow. He's got EP3s. He's got two Type R's. He's got DB8. Anyway, so he drives me to this place. It's all on construction. Like there's just scaffolding everywhere and everything. And he goes in and talks to the guy. He comes back out. He goes, hey, listen, I told the guys, I probably shouldn't be saying this. I told the guys, you got, you work for Honda Corporate and you're here to inspect the building. I'm like, no, you didn't. He goes, that's the only way they're going to let you in. <laughs> so I put a hard hat on. I walk through the building. I'm checking everything out. Yeah. It's crazy because out there, like here in America, they basically bring most of the building to you and you just kind of put it together, right? There, they mix their own concrete on premises. They cut their own rebarb on premises. None of the stuff comes in. They make it all there because it's probably just cheaper, right? So I'm walking through the scaffolding and this stuff's like super rickety. It's eight stories tall. And I thought for sure that I was going to die. Like, this is how I'm going to die, right? In a Honda dealership in Guatemala. There's no OSHA out there. It's a good way to go, you know, Honda dealership. I mean, if I'm going to go, that's the way I should go. <laughs> so we finished the tour. I get to the airport just in the nick of time. They're like, they're calling my name. I make the plane. And they're like, hey, listen, we're doing the grand opening. You got to come back out. Absolutely. President of Honda is coming out. I will definitely be there. So I'm there with the president of Honda. We're in a meeting. Guatemala guys are all there. The Guatemalan guys leave. And I looked at him. I go, you know, we're in Guatemala. He goes, what are we doing in Guatemala? I go, I have no idea. Like, how is this dealership possible? He goes, I've never seen anything like it. I'm like, me neither. He goes, in Guatemala? Because you don't think, if I asked you where the biggest Honda dealership was, would Guatemala be in your first 100 guesses? So let me ask you, if it's in Russia or something. You Japan, pay, anywhere. Like a big country. Texas. Yeah, Texas. Well, I'll ask the official question here is, you've been to a lot of dealerships. Yeah. Where in the where in the world and what dealership is the coolest Honda dealership that you've been to and why? The Guatemala one's pretty cool. I'm not going to lie. It's, is it the coolest? It, no, I mean, it's, it's eight stories. They sell everything but the Honda Jet. But I've been to Honda dealerships that have full restaurants inside. I've been to Honda dealerships that have movie theaters inside. There's a dealership in Ohio that took over a mall. A mall went out of business. They turned the entire mall into a dealership. A Honda dealership. A Honda dealership. So just here is selling, ev so like everything Honda. No. In this country, Honda dealerships sell cars only. In Europe and Asia, they can sell everything. How come? The only thing I can come up with is Honda motorcycle dealerships don't want Honda salesmen to sell their products. Lawnmower and ATVs don't want you know Honda dealerships to sell their products. Honda uh, uh, cars, Honda cars sell their stuff. Honda motorcycles sell their stuff. Honda ATVs and motorsports sell their stuff, and they're just separated. They're all different entities. Out of Europe, they're all one entity. Yeah, I'm more surprised that they sell them all under one roof because just like you're saying, it's hard for a salesperson to know everything, kind of be a Honda pro, then add in generators, lawnmowers, yeah. and all of the above. Like, like, how is somebody supposed to know everything about this? That'd be tough. You're right. I'm sure they have specialists that cover different parts inside that dealership. In Europe, there's a dealership that has escalators to go to the second story inside the showroom. So back to the original question, because you mentioned some cool dealerships which is the coolest Honda dealership that you've been to? That's like, This is a big accolade for somebody to say right here that... Here's the thing. Jason gave it to us. He just said it. That's like asking me what my favorite Honda is. I like different dealerships for different reasons. Top three. Top three dealerships. Guatemala. Because it's eight stories. Because it's eight stories. Okay. Um... The one in Ohio. Because that it's it, a mall. Because it's a mall. And 
the name of this escaping me right now, so I apologize, guys. There is one in Wichita, Kansas, that is completely insanely beautiful. Their parts department, you walk in one side, you walk through a whole parts department, and then you have to exit another door. So it's not like a counter you walk in, it's a whole walk around. There's a one in California. So the, the, your third one was Kansas, and Kansas. it's because of its parts department? I love the part. The dealership itself is beautiful, but the parts department's like nothing I've ever seen before. I, I can't That's picture it. Like, what is... It's, it looks like your showroom. It's an actual showroom. Because it's an actual... The parts departments are just a, a counter. A counter. Yeah. This is the showroom surrounded by glass. And there's stuff for display. Everywhere. There's stands. There's clothes everywhere. It's like a store inside. So figure, picture a store inside of a dealership. Yeah, a lot of dealerships don't have stores. They don't have stores because they don't care. That's not where their money maker is. There's a dealership in California. It's two stories. There's two huge circular stairwells going up. And one of the walls, which is almost as big as the wall behind us, is a fish tank. The entire wall is a fish tank. Where is this? It's in California. So, so uh, yeah. Irvine area. I think it's uh, Scott Scott Robinson, I think is the name of the dealer. They're massive. That's a really, really nice dealership. Now, you named four. I'm sure there's uh, there's some Honda dealerships that... you Do you think there's Honda dealerships that are really cool that you don't even know of? That you haven't been to yet? Or you heard that like you have to go to? There there are some dealerships I've heard that I have to go to. So they're building one that's actually just outside Chicago. The dealership that I worked at for 20 years is rebuilding a new dealership. It's a I think the number is 140,000 square feet. Wow. It's massive. Wow. Inside they can hold 800 cars. Wow. The showroom is two levels. Not you could see two levels. They'll have cars on the top and the bottom of the showroom. It's totally insane. Or like a dealership with all all inside. Yeah, if you think about it for Chicago, it makes sense. The winter and the cold and everything. All right, we spoke about the best dealerships in the U.S. What is the worst Honda dealership in the U.S.? Man, you guys are putting me on a blast here. So there is a dealership. I'm not. Oh, he's going to do it. No, I'm going to sell you. I'm going to tell him because the dealership's a piece of crap. So not the people. People are awesome. The owner's are awesome. The dealership itself is. Are you saying the building? The building and the dealership, like the whole. It was. It's a very small dealership. It's in the United States on the West Coast. When you walk in and you look up, half the tiles are literally hanging down. Most of them are stained. The offices. One office was literally just a printer. Another office had like. All the stuff that you would use for like the promotional stuff, like the stand ups and all the stuff that goes on the cars, was all shoved into another office. The I don't know how they sold cars. The showroom was barely long enough to fit cars. The, the showroom had carpet, carpeted, stained, dirty this is recent. oil. This is about three years ago. Okay. So you could fit three cars in the showroom all in a row. And you couldn't open up any of the doors because you'd hit the offices, the pop-up offices of there. It looks like they built a showroom out of like an old subway or something. Maybe like it, was it was a temporary dealership. It They were there for about 10 years. <laughs> it was not temporary. So has it been renovated since? It, it, I believe it has. I believe they've renovated it. I believe they've actually knocked it down and rebuilt it. But at the time, it was a large, it was an owner that owned many other Honda dealerships. And when I walked in, they're like, listen, it doesn't look that great. I'm like, I'm sure it's not that bad. I got in and I'm like, this is really, and you guys want me to train here? Like how, I, how, can't even open the doors. I can't open the doors of the car. We had to bring all the cars outside. There was no front. There was no, there's just two side entrances. The front of it was right at. The front of it was right at the stairs. But you said the uh, people there and the owners were cool. Isn't it the owner's responsibility to make sure this place looks represents the brand correct? If I remember correctly, the owner had just bought it. So the previous owner let it go down. The new owner just bought it. He was going to renovate it. 
Isn't there a, like a format? So I used to work at Honda when okay. I was in college, I worked at the parts store. Cool. And we were renovating when I was there and and I don't know if this is sure or not, they were like, we have to follow Honda's standards. So what they did was when they renovated, there were no offices. They said, we're not having office anymore. There was a congregation area in the back where they would work. Yep. And then everything would be open. Yeah. And no one would have a signed desk. You would just, if you have a customer, you just pick a desk and you just sit there and you sign it away. That was called generation three. That was kind of their idea. So they do generation one, two, or three. Now they're on generation four which they're just starting, which is all like EV stuff. It's all like electrified and everything. But yeah, that was, that was their theme for a long time. And most dealerships had to you know, abide by that when they rebuilt the store. This store happened to be built in like the 80s. So at that time, it didn't matter. So there's a few stores that have gotten around that. There's a store out in uh, Saratoga, New York. I think it's Saratoga. Saratoga. With, yeah, yeah, Saratoga, New York, where... The whole area was all red rocks. And they told Honda, we can't do this blue and all the stuff you want. We need to do it with red rock and wood. And if you go to the dealership, the whole front of the dealership is all this beautiful red wood. There's rocks everywhere. It doesn't look like a Honda dealership at all. It looks like a museum. And they got the okay from Honda to do that. Much like the mall dealership, same idea. They got the okay from Honda to build it that way. To be unique. But, yeah, but most of the time they have to you know, follow a format that Honda demands 100%. Right. So you've done a lot of cool Honda things. How about, what is your coolest memory? Mm, not memory. What is your coolest moment related to Honda racing? Oh, that's a great question. So I did some stuff with uh, Honda Off-Road Racing uh, that does the, the, the 500s and everything, the rubber, not the rubber racing. Is that HPD? Uh, it's not HPD. They work with HPD. Okay. So it's uh, the company is J Sport, and they do a lot of off-road Honda racing. They're an off-road Honda racing company. So they do all the Baja 500s, the Baja 1000s. Oh, nice. okay. They do the Ridgeline. They race the Ridgeline out there. So I was invited to go out there and do some testing with the Ridgeline on California. And that was probably the most insane thing I ever did. Like a stock Ridgeline or a trophy truck Ridgeline? It's, so they're not trophy trucks. It's a built Ridgeline, but it's not a trophy truck. So it uses a Honda engine, a Honda V6, 3.5, built by HPD, twin turbocharged. And it's the body of a Ridgeline. Oh, okay. So I, they call it, they say it's not a trophy truck because I think trophy trucks have different bodies, different engines, different this, different that. This is an actual Baja race truck for a certain class. And they allowed me in the truck as they drove it. So I had full race suit. Full harness, got all, all buckled in. Testing or competition? Uh, no testing. Okay. But we went through like the whoops at like 70 miles an hour and just like. <laughs> and then there's a screen in front of you as a passenger and they show like miles per hour and RPMs and everything. Yeah, you're and technically the navigator. You're the navigator. Right. And so we're going through this big open area and looking at the speed, 91, 95, 100. I go, is that accurate? He goes. It's accurate. Hang on. He goes, why? He goes, because we're going to jump. I go, we're going to jump. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, we're off the air. And I'm like, and then we land, boom. And it felt completely out of control. Like, I thought we were going to just launch the thing because he's making all these adjustments and the truck is just left and right all over the place. I'm like, we're going to die. Like, I'm going to roll over and die. It was completely insane. It was the most fun and the craziest thing I've ever done with Honda on four wheels. How, how, By far. how long was that ride for? That ride was probably about two or three minutes. Dang. So second to that- You made it seem like it was going to go for hours. It felt like it was going to go for hours. Like I would have gone for hours. Really? Was, I got out, but I was totally sweating. You're like, could we do this again? Totally. I would totally want to do that again. The second favorite thing I did, are you guys familiar with Honda's mean mower? No. That is the foul- oh, the, uh, Fastest rideable mower. Oh, I saw your video about that. Okay. Fastest rideable mower. Honda built the fastest rideable mower. It's called the Mean Mower. They did it about nine or 10 years ago. That went viral. Well, the first one went viral instantly. But then about four months later, another company took um, a John Deere and put like a Viper engine in it oh, and uh. beat the Honda. 
And so the Guinness Book of World's Records said, that's it. Someone's going to kill themselves. Ugh. So if you're going to break the record again, we'll give you the record. But if you're going to break it again, the engine and the chassis have to match. Honda, Honda, John Deere, John Deere, Rider, Rider, whatever it is. So Honda's like, we're going to do it again. So they hired a company called um, Engine Dynamics, I think, out in the UK, because they don't make the riding lawnmower here in the US, only in the UK. So like, hey, can you guys put a CBRR, the motorcycle engine, inside a riding lawnmower and break the world's record? And they're like, yeah, we can do it. I was thinking they put like a Indy motor in there. No, any motor. See, that's the thing. Any motors you think you can just throw in anything, but you can't. And one of the big problems, and we'll, we can get to that later if you want, the Indy motor is mounted not to motor mounts, but to the actual like suspension of the car. The suspension becomes a motor mount to the engine. So you can't just throw that in anything, which is some of the issues that Hoonigans had when they tried to do the Ridgeline with the Indy car. But so Honda hires this company and they build this in, they build this uh, riding lawnmower, the fastest riding lawnmower. They test it. It's the fastest in the world. They set the new world's record. Then Honda corporate goes, hey, listen, you did it. Just keep it. We don't want anything to do with it now. Just hold it for us. We don't want anyone riding it. We don't, it's too dangerous. Like it's, it's insane. So then Jay Leno comes along. Like Jay Leno, Jay Leno. And he goes, I heard about the mean mower. Honda's like, yeah. He goes, I want to ride it. And like, ah, we don't really want anyone riding it. And he goes, what do I have to do to get it here so I can ride it? And they said, we got to bring it here. So the story I heard was he charters a plane, picks a mean mower up from the UK and brings it to the US. And now PR department's like, well, since it's here, maybe we'll invite some people over and get some PR on this. So they invite me out and 13 other journalists to ride it the day before Jay Leno does. So we go out to California City, which is where Hottest Proving Grounds is. We see the mean mower and it's a lawnmower with the CBRR engine in it. So it's like, a, was that a thousand? It's a thousand CC. So this thing's insane. It's got no suspension at all. It's a lawnmower. It's got like these little 12 inch tires and there's no seatbelt. There's no safety harness. There's no roll cage. It's a lawnmower, literally. Yeah. So they bring us in this room. They prep us. They talk to us like, hey, listen, here's the deal. We need you to sign all these forms. We have emergency on site. We have a helicopter if needed, because if something happens, we need you to bring to the, we need you to bring we need to bring you to the hospital immediately. So, eight of us decided to go. The other people opted out. Really? They got all the way there, and they're like, "We'll film it. We're not going to ride it." Uh, like, okay. I'm going to ride it. Yeah. How did I ride it? So they got us all up in a suit, got helmets on, and everything. And it was too powerful to launch in first gear, so you had to launch it in second gear. And they only gave us a quarter mile. It was the scariest quarter mile I've ever experienced because you're literally sitting on the ground and you know that there's nothing around you. And they said, if you lose, you can't turn the steering wheel. If you lose control, try to push out because if this rolls, you're done. You need to exit yourself from this vehicle. So I did two laps in it and it was, or two runs in it insane. I think I got up to like 117 miles an hour is like my max speed, but it is, it was a rush and it was insane. Very cool. That's wow. Yeah, it's fun. Anything, have you done anything with Honda F1? I haven't done anything with Honda F1. Yeah, I did some stuff with Indy. I did a uh, ride along with Mario Andretti. Nice. Which is really fun. They have like the, the dual seat thing and they cruise around the track a couple times. Okay. It's fun, dude. It's really fun. Look at so you do a lot of traveling, yeah. And we've spoken in the past. You like pushing it to the limit. Like <laughs> me and my wife, when we get to the airport, she wants to go two hours ahead of time because we got the kid. You literally show up twenty minutes before the board before the flight leaves. Like literally, the they're closing the doors and you pull up and you do this ninety five percent of your flights. Yeah. Any any crazy stories? I, I've missed a couple of flights. I'm not gonna lie. I missed a couple of flights. I missed one flight. No. Uh, leaving the Netherlands. So what I did is there was a trip we used to take every year before COVID and I fly to the UK. I meet the guys over at uh, Dream Automotive, a big uh, Honda place yeah, out there. Right. And we drive from there to France, from France 
all the way down to um this is recent um I haven't done this trip in about or right before COVID. I haven't done the trip since COVID. But didn't you do a pol? Didn't you do a Poland trip last year or something? I did a Poland trip, and then I flew to Sweden, and I did Sweden all the way down to France for a hundred euro meet. Uh, this one we did, the we did the UK. I'm sorry, we did the UK to Germany to Nuremberg, drove the Nuremberg, and then from there we would go to uh, France for a hundred euro meet. So this year I go out there, I fly out to Dream Automotive, and the guys were like, "Hey, listen." You're going to get the new, this is right before I got my uh, FK8. He goes, hey, you're going to get the FK8? I'm like, yeah. He goes, we have a downpipe that fit the current FL2 um, out of the UK, uh, FK2 out of the UK. They're like, hey, if it fits the Type R in the UK, because they had the Type R before we did in the US, it should fit the US version. So we're going to give you a downpipe. So they give me the downpipe when I get to the UK. So now I'm traveling with the downpipe from the UK to Germany, from Germany, France, France, back to UK. How did I get, I got, I got to the Netherlands somehow. Oh, I'm sorry, my bad. We actually went from the UK, there's a different trip, we went from the UK to France, France to Germany, Germany to the Netherlands for Honda Fest. Uh, not to Honda Eurometers, Honda Fest. So I go to the Netherlands for Honda Fest and all the guys drove back and I flew home. So I'm bringing this downpipe with me everywhere and I'm like shoving socks in there and everything, trying to make more room in my bag. Run late to the airport as always, just because that's how I roll. I get up there to security and the security goes through and they stop me and they're like, oh, open up your bag. Open up my bag. I'm like, hey, it's, you know, it's just, it's a downpipe, just metal. Like you can't fly with that. And what do you mean I can't fly with that? They're like, we don't want you to fly with that. I, we don't know what it is. I take out all the socks. I look through it. I'm like, look, hello. It's, uh, there's nothing in there. Just a downpipe. It's a piece of metal. No, no, no. You can't fly with that. Oh, what do you want me to do? Was it like, it was a carry on? A carry on. Yeah. It was, I'm sorry. It was a carry on. I don't check. I can't check my bags. I show up way too late for that. So they're like, you need to check it. I go, it's too late to check it. Like, well, you got to do something. You can't bring it. So either you check it or you throw it away and you get on the plane. I'm not throwing it away. The downpipes are not cheap. It was a gift. So... I run downstairs to like to check in. I go, hey, listen, I have a problem. I need you guys to ship this for me. And they're like, we're not going to ship it. I go, well, where can I ship it? Just give me a place to ship it. I need to get on a plane. They're like, there's a place that's two miles, two miles down the road. Two miles in the airport. There's no way I'm going to make my flight. Not our problem. I go, it's your problem. You won't let me on the flight. They're like, no, that's like security's problem. Not our problem. So I go back upstairs. I'm like, I'm literally holding this thing in my hand pacing back and forth in front of a garbage can with the downpipe with the downpipe and dude one of the security guys looks at me he goes hey i go what's up he goes um are you honda pro jason <laughs> I, go, I am he goes what's wrong you look stressed i'm like bro i tell him what happened he goes which guy told you you couldn't bring it he goes don't point just tell me i have the guy with the beard he goes hang on another guy comes over he goes my employee says he knows you oh yeah i'm a youtuber he goes what's the problem i go I want to get on the plane with this. He goes, that's it. I go, yeah. He goes, go ahead. Awesome. So again, he goes, you better hurry though. So I got my dump pipe in my hand. I got my bags in my hand. I'm running as fast as I can. I get to the terminal and I can see the jet bridge pulling away from the plane. Mm -hmm. And the people go, Jason Richmond? I go, yeah. They're like, you're too late. We waited as long as I could. I go, security this? He goes, we knew where you were. We could see you when you checked in everywhere. We can't help you. Son of a bitch. I'm like, what's going on? So I go to, uh, I think it was Delta at the time. Delta switched my flight. They're like, yeah, no problem. We can switch your flight. It's fine. I uh, No big deal. You'll get home. It'll be a little bit later, but it won't charge anymore. And everything was good. So fast forward to the press release or the press drive, the, uh, the new FL5. Or, I'm sorry, the press drive for the FK8. So I had the dial pipe at home. I'm waiting to get my car. And they have this huge thing about the FK8 saying, hey, listen, we took the engine and transmission straight from the European Type R. I'm like, cool. That sounds great. So I'm talking to the guys later. I'm like, you know, what's funny is that I have a downpipe for the car ready. They're like, you do? Where'd you get it? I got it from Dream Automotive. It's the same one they use for the FK2. And they're like, is it going to fit? I go, well, you said it's the same engine in trans, so why would it not fit? He goes, can we make a phone call? I go, who are you going to call? He goes, we're going to call Japan. Don't let me stop you. Call Japan. Dude calls Japan. He gets off the phone. He gets up back to me. He goes, we have a problem. I go, what's wrong? He goes, well, the FK8 
sits lower than the F, uh, FK2. I go, and? He goes, and the downpipe, we had to bend it up, otherwise it would have hit the ground. So we had to manipulate it to bend it up more so the one you have isn't going to fit. After all of that, I got a piece of nothing in my hand. I'm like, oh my God. Uh, Luckily, I was able to call the company Dream Automotive. Yeah. And before they shipped them all to the US, they were able to modify them and then ship them. Ah, well, I guess it paid off in some. Yeah, I guess all is well done as well. If you didn't go through that, then they would have shipped them. They would have shipped them all. And yeah. Well, so your headache, you should have. I saved everyone. Everyone, everyone that had, yeah. Everyone that's running the Dream Automotive Dot Pipe, you're welcome. <laughs> you know what would have solved that issue? Because you were because you were trying to get well, the, getting there earlier would have been one solution. The other solution would have been instead of riding Delta, if you had a Honda Jet. The Honda. You, you Jet. ever rides? Have Speaking you ever have Honda Jet? Yeah. Have you ever rode a Honda Jet? I've flown the Honda Jet, like like a pilot, like a pilot. Like you were allowed. Oh to do yeah, that? I was allowed to do it. What? So by like yourself? Honda Jet? No, Auto no, no. I had a. a Co-pilot with me. Oh, yeah, no, not by myself. I would, I would have crashed that. you land. No, that's like a $5 million plane. I would have crashed that for sure. On autopilot. So here's what happened. How the jet contacts me? And this is back in uh, like 2016, middle of 2016. They're like, hey, listen, we want you to come out, do a full review on the Honda jet. And that sounds amazing. They're in Greensboro, North Carolina. That's where they build the Honda jet, built in America. Everything is built in Greensboro, except for the fuselage. It comes like down the street, but everything's made in America. Okay. So, okay. We want you to do a full review on the Honda jet. I go, it sounds great. I go, they're like, what do you want to do? I'm like, I want to do this and this and this, and obviously take a flight. And they're like, ha, ha, ha. you can't take a flight. And why not? They're like, it's four at the time it was $4.5 million. They're like, we only fly people that are going to buy it. You know, why would I go all the way out there? to do a review on a plane and not fly it. Makes no sense to me. They're like, well, we're really sorry, but you can't fly it. Hey, I'm not coming. They're like, okay, I, I guess then that's the end of it. That's the end of it. Week and a half later, I get an email. Basically, you're cleared for flight. <laughs> Excellent. Let's do this. So we set up a date. The date comes. I contact them. Hey, I'm ready. I'm going to come out. They're like, I'm ah, really sorry. We had to wrap up production. We have no one to bring you out in for the tour or for the flight, we'll have to reschedule. For when? We are no when. Every three weeks, I send an email. Hey, you guys ready? No. You guys ready? No. You guys ready? No. You guys ready? Yes. You're ready. We're ready. Thanks for being on us. We're ready to go. It's the same weekend that I'm going to pick up my car at a dealership um, just outside in uh, Schenectady, New York, which is where I picked up my FK8. The next day after I pick my FK up, I have to drive down to Greensboro to take a ride in, in this airplane. So it's like perfect timing. I get out there, I take the full tour. It's unbelievable. Like it, it's incredible to see them make an airplane. I learned so much that I had no idea. Like the airplane has two wings, right? This plane has one wing. The wing is one piece that goes all the way across. It's not two pieces. I thought for sure Two wings, two pieces, it's one piece that goes all the way across. Just the avionics and the electronics and everything that goes into this was unbelievable. And just to watch them build a plane was crazy. So I do the tour. I walk around the plane. I meet the pilot. Pilot sits me down. He goes, okay, cool. He goes, what do you want to do when we're up in the air? I go, what are my options? He goes, ah, we can do a stall and a fast takeoff. We can do this turn and this turn. I go, can we do everything? He goes, we can do everything. Cool. He goes, you want to fly it, right? I go, I want to fly it. I'm not a pilot. Right. I've flown like a little, like a little Cessna thing when I was younger, right? But that was it. And what I've done. So we get up in the air. He's showing me all the stuff. I'm sitting there just giggling. It's so much fun. I'm recording everything. We're BSing and talking. I'm trying to get some Easter eggs out of him. He's like, there's no Easter eggs in here. So we're, we're doing all this stuff. We're having a lot of fun. He goes, you ready to fly? I go, yeah, I just want to tell you something real quick. Like, I'm not a pilot. He goes, I know who you are. You're a YouTuber. He goes, yeah. He goes, you got this. I'm like, cool. So he starts hitting all these buttons. All these alarms are going off. I go, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I'm taking off all the autopilots. You're going to hand fly it. I go, I don't know if that's a good idea. He goes, you got this. And we're like, I don't know, 25,000 feet. I'm like, cool, let's do it. 
So I grabbed the stick. He's like, pull back. Wait, do you have, you have to switch seats or something? No, no, no. You can fly from either side. Okay. So what's cool about the Honda jet, it's a single pilot airplane. That's what makes it unique. Most of the jets in the class, you need a co-pilot. This one, you don't. And the reason why is all the controls and everything are on each side. So you usually need a co-pilot to do certain controls. And what happens is, let's say you own a business. Let's say you own a, a huge company like Eastly Brace. And you're a pilot. In order for you to bring your family out in your on your jet, you need a co-pilot. Right. Which means now you need someone else to co-pilot with you. Right. In the Honda jet, you can go yourself with your family. You don't need a co-pilot. It's just you. So both controls are the same. So we didn't have to switch seats or nothing. So we're up there. I'm doing my thing. I'm like, boy, this is so cool. He's like recording me and everything. And he goes, okay, cool. He goes, I want you to bank right, but hard. So I'm like, he goes, more. And now you've never flown a plane, right? No. It is so much different than a car. Like a car, if something goes wrong or you freak out, you can just stop. There's no stopping in the air. Like you're in it. There's nothing to do. And you don't just have left, right, forward, backward. You can tilt side to side. You can yaw. There's like, I don't know, 15 different directions you can go plus up and down. So there's a lot that goes through your head. So I'm trying to turn, trying to turn, and the plane's starting to bank. He goes, hang on. He goes, let me show you what I mean. And at this point, he banks it really, really, really hard. So the plane's like almost on its side. He goes, we're not going to roll over. I look out the window. Let me make a suggestion. Don't do that. If they bank you in a plane, do not look out the window. Because the horizon goes, disappears, comes back as he comes back, disappears again as he goes. And then your stomach goes this way and this way. And I didn't throw up because that would have been super embarrassing. Yeah, that would have been. I was so close though. Yeah. I was so close. So we land the plane. We get out. I'm like, man, that was awesome. That was amazing. We're talking a little bit. He goes, whose black car is that? I go, it's mine. He goes, is that the new Type R? He goes, I go, yeah. He goes, I've never seen it. I go, go take a look at it. Here are the keys. Go take it for a ride. He goes, I'm not going to drive your car. I go, bro, you just I just flew... $4.5 million plane, the least you could do is fly, uh, drive my car. He takes it out, drives it around, comes back, goes, man, that was insane. I go, that's how I feel. Yeah, yeah, so it was cool. It was very fun. Man, what a cool story. Yeah, thank you. So you've been around the world yeah. multiple times. I know your favorite food is the hamburger. I do love burgers. So you've ate a lot in your life. Wait, Warrior. let's clear, because I think I, I, I said cheeseburger. You did. So no cheese. No cheese. Okay. All right. Let's clap. I, I, didn't, I don't do good with the lactose. Okay. So not cheeseburger, hamburger. Hamburger, okay. which, which is important because most places you go to, if you order a double burger or a burger, they almost always throw cheese on it. So I have to specifically tell them, double burger, no cheese. Okay. Where in the world is the best hamburger? There's two of them. One is in Hamburg, Germany, which is where they started the hamburger. It's this little spot, this little bar in Hamburg, Germany, where they say they've been doing hamburgers since like the 1700s. It was unbelievable. What's the name of the spot? I'm going to have to get back. I don't remember. All right. Uh, Fritz's, Francis, Fr Fr Frisier, Frisier Mushroom. Somebody corrects you. Someone will correct me, I'm sure, on this and say, hey, it's this place. You went there. Okay. But it is in Hamburg, Germany. The other one is going to be, wait for it. Don't say in and out I'd never say in and out for okay. the best. Guatemala. Really? Hamburger Chef is the name of the place. It's a, a food truck on the side of the road in Guatemala. He makes the burgers at his house. He brings them in and he has a special like sauce made with some sort of pineapple and something else. And he puts tortilla chips on the burger. It is unbelievable. It's it honestly, it's when I go to Guatemala, the first thing I think about is that burger. It's that good. What's the name of the place? It's a burger chef. A burger chef. It's called yeah, it's called Burger Chef. So when I go to Guatemala, I just go to a burger chef. Yeah, just tell them that you want to go where Honda Pro Jason goes and they'll bring you to <laughs> trust me, they'll know and they'll bring you right to Burger Chef. Okay. The guy's awesome. Okay. Yeah. It's going to be hard for us to do an episode of Fastest Food at either of those spots. Why? Well. Brian, just go. Just go. Well, yeah. Bro, you brought me 
to a taco shop. Well, how, fast how about in the U.S.? For shop. In the U.S., best oh, hammer. I see what you're saying here. I don't know, man. There's so many good ones. There's so one, many good ones. One. So one that stood out to you. Here, here's the deal. I eat so many burgers. I remember the cities they're in, but I know you're going to ask me for the name of the place. Yes. Okay. So That's going to be the problem. Okay. Let's start there. City. So there was one in New York City. Manhattan? That, uh, in Manhattan. It had a burger that they put lobster on top of it, which I would have never thought was good. Isn't that a um, lobster burger? It's in Midtown? I... My brother brought me there. My now brother I need in New York. Now that's 45 minutes from here. Now I want to try it. We can go. That right. place we can go to. Text your brother. I'll, so, I'll, I'll text him. I'll find out where it is. So our friends go to a burger spot called Jackson Hole. Okay. You ever tried that? I don't think so. All right. Well, tell your brother you want to go to Jackson Hole. There's a few of them in the city. Okay. Try that burger. And I've never had it either. We should go. Let's go. Big. big. Okay. It's a big burger. So I'm, I'm down for that. So I'm. I'm down for big burgers. Like I'm down for, you know, burger contests and all that stuff. So, yeah. So add yeah. your brother where Jackson Hole is and, and try it and let us know. Jackson. Jackson Hole. Well, we should go. Yeah, we should go. Fast you, food. You round owe, two. You owe me a fast yeah. food round two after the tacos. You maybe eat and burn my tongue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right. Fastest food round two. Jason, it's always a pleasure. Burgers. Thank always you. a pleasure having chopping it up with you. Thank you for coming by. Thank you for coming by. I know, um, where's your next stop? I'm going to Indonesia on Saturday morning. And that's what's up. And today is that's, uh, I know you said Thursday? That, right? Today's, oh, today's almost Thursday. Yeah. No, it is Thursday. It's 12. It's So it's Thursday. So Saturday morning, I leave for Indonesia just for a few days. That's going to be fun. Very cool. cool. Very cool. All right, guys. Appreciate you watching. Eat Sleep Raise podcast. If you want to follow us on our social media at Brian ESR on Instagram, at Frankie5 ESR on Instagram, and of course at Honda Pro Jason. Jason, you got any other shout outs you want to do for your for your socials if anyone wants to follow you, except your social security number? All of my all of my socials are Honda Pro Jason. I just keep it real simple. Very cool. All right. Appreciate you guys. If you liked today's episode, make sure you like, comment, subscribe. And stay tuned for the next podcast. See you.